zoning laws. And I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Todd, I'd like to also remind people that we are going to um, open discussion up. The, the board will discuss. Then we'll open it up to the public. The public will have two minutes to speak. Each person will get two minutes to speak. And then after everyone else has a chance, they can do a second time. So is that uh, work for you? Awesome. OK, that's what we'd like to do. All right, thank you. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to slightly turn to the audience on this one. Uh, many of you are customers. We're happy to have you back. And you heard uh, me go through the zone change the last meeting. Nothing's changed, obviously. There's more for some time. They went through the planning council process late this summer. And tonight really is your hearing to talk about the zoning changes, questions, impacts, what you may, what you may not understand, what you may not love. Uh, brief overview, the changes are actually pretty minimal uh, overall compared to previous years. Last year was a pretty happy zoning change. Uh, this year, we're pushing through all of our work completed since last fall in order to clean the slate for S100. S100 was an act of legislature approved <coughs> last year that, among other things, made single family zoning illegal, disallowed towns to require more than one parking space per unit, had a whole slew of changes. And the Planning Council needs to tackle that immediately in the coming months, and that's the plan. The plan was kind of to get everything else off the table, start with a clean slate before we did that, and that's what this zoning update does. On the whole, most of the zoning changes here are things there where the Planning Council has written a new rule. Uh, for example, things like uh, primary uh, entrance for a house, Things uh, on a corner lot where the DRB had questions and the Planning Council answered those questions in the form of revised regulations, and that's what's before you tonight. So uh, briefly, the main part of the zone, I'm not going to go through line by line, a lot of you to ask questions on line by line, and there are Planning Council members here to do that as well. You know, you're not stuck with just me tonight. Uh, the main part of the change, really, the meat and potatoes of, the, of today's entree, or today's entree, is Section 206. So last year, the Planning Council wrote a very extensive <laughs> rules for design criteria for historic buildings, and that was section 207. That applies to the main core of downtown, the commercial core of downtown, historic Morrisville. Section 206 is really the surrounding core of the residential area. And these changes do two important things. First, these changes extend uh, our design criteria, which is basically the town <laughs> regulating what buildings look like, in, 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 a set, in, in essence, how they function into the residential areas and first into medium density residential. Look at the zoning map above. Jason, if you look at last year, just the core of the CD, the little pink zone, is what was section 207. <coughs> this year, in high density residential was already there. MDR, which is to the right, Jason, one up right there, MDR. I'm to the right there, there you go. Medium density residential and Wilkins and Wabin Street, those areas as well. So that's what these regulations <laughs> extend to. <laughs> extends to kind of these design requirements of those new areas. In addition, or extends the design requirements to a new use. Previously, these design requirements were only for multifamily housing, three or more units on the larger apartment building built, being built in town. For the first time, these design requirements are extended to duplexes. So anything that's a two family use or more in a parcel is now applicable to these design criteria in medium density residential. So those are the two changes, two expansions of the regulation are. MDR is now regulated, and two units, two classes are now regulated. So that's really the main thing on here. Other than that, uh, there is uh, parking requirements. That was per S100, the new legislative act, homes for everyone, that says it's illegal for towns to require more than one space per dwelling unit. Uh, that's in here under section 450. There are some changes to uh, site plan review for how to screen parking lots from roadside view in terms of how they're landscaped and what the the width of landscaping is. There's also some small changes to Section 510 Conservation Subdivision that allow it's not ideal to have village properties or close by properties that can be connected to village water and sewer using septic systems if you don't have to. If we want to maximize our density in the village and leave our countryside rural and open, you kind of want to make use of those village lands, especially the village lands or nearby lands that can use water and sewer. And these are two carrots to encourage developers to do exactly that. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's section 510 I just talked about, which allows 
Townhouse style development for class one development. Class one is using village water and sewer. We're allowing a, a density bonus for class two development, which is basically a development that uses village water or sewer, not both, one of the two. Quite often, sewer uses gravity. So sewer is harder to get to for parts of the village and parts of the town. Water is either. There's a giant water tank, water is pressurized. So water can go up hills and down valleys. Sewer cannot. Sewer comes down to the sewer plant gravity, large unless it's a pump station, but we don't allow pump stations. Uh, and that's pretty much it for the zoning regulations. So happy to start with the select board with any questions. Happy to ask, answer any questions with the audience. Really, this is your meeting. This is the public hearing to uh, to talk about format. They are not allowed, allowed to vote tonight. So the select board is going to have a public hearing tonight. The village trustees of Eagle State are zoning at a public hearing Wednesday night. And then both boards can vote at the next regular meeting. The next regular meeting for the village will come on November 1st, and the select board's next regular meeting will be November 6th. So that's when these votes can happen um, if they're both ready to vote. Again, as I've explained before, we function as a joint planning council in DRG, and our rules are joint. So both the select board and the trustees have to <coughs> vote the exact same thing. Otherwise, you keep going at it until you get it right. Any questions? I have a question. Yes, Laura. Uh, just speaking about the uh, density yes. for the developers, uh, and now that we have the S100 state, uh, I'm assuming that is anything in here redundant with the S100 or because we were, we've been working on this for so long. No, I don't think so. Uh, the parking is only part in here that deals with S100. S100 in a nutshell uh, makes single family zoning illegal in rural areas. So everywhere in the town, it's now duplex zoning. Everyone can have two dwelling units per parcel. Anywhere in a village, if you're connected to water and sewer, it's four units per parcel. So every village house that's got a village sewer connection, water connection, the town cannot restrict it to any less than four units. And anywhere in the town with no village water or sewer connection, it's now restricted to the town can't restrict it to any less than two units now. So that's the really the big change. And there's some other changes here, how you deal with that. But no, this is really the table setter for S100, which the planning council really needs to focus on and deal with as soon as this is done. This is just meant to clear the table so we can tackle S100 in unison. So yeah, so I just want to make sure that there's nothing in here that we're going to run into problems, no. any kind of conflict with S100. No, one of the reasons we did this ahead of doing S100 separately is there would have been some complications in here with language we want to do or zones that are slightly tweaked and you're dealing mm -hmm. with S100 at the same time. It's, oh, it's this change and it's this overall change. Mm -hmm. So this makes it more of an iterative process. We're doing this, we get this done, then we're doing this. So we're not throwing everything on to, into a big ball and seeing what comes out. And second question, does um, accessory apartments qualify as two units? There's still a separate use. So the way the legislator did, legislature did it, uh, the accessory apartments right now, uh, under state statutes, 30% of your living space. So if you have a house that's a thousand, two, let's call it 2,000 square feet, which is a somewhat large single family home, uh, you can have accessory apartment that's 600 square feet under the law, or, or they also allow a 900 square foot allowance. So the nice thing about accessory apartment, I have one myself. If you have an accessory apartment, you are treated as a single family home. State building code does not apply. Electrical code does not apply. Plumbing code does not apply. So you're still treated as a single family home. Once you violate that smaller diminutive requirement for the second unit, the second unit is supposed to look subordinate to the main house. Once you get into duplex land where you're doing two 2,000 square foot homes or two 1,000 square foot homes, state building code requires plumbing, electrical, if you're a creature of the state, <clears throat> it's no longer a single family home. It's no longer treated and regulated as such. So that's the main difference. Okay. So even though with the S100 changes in the future, every one of you can do a duplex out of your house. You can, you can build a separate house in your property if you want. But building code will apply, or you can do an accessory apartment attached or detached, and state building codes will not apply if you stay under that 30% threshold. So you have a clear choice in that one. Okay, thank you. But that'll be, uh, <laughs> we'll see you back here next next summer or fall for how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how large your property is out in the town. I mean, how small your property is in the town, you can put a, a duplex on there? Correct. And that trumps any kind of covenants? Uh, it, any covenants going forward, yes. Any covenants going forward, not covenants, it doesn't obviate covenants going in the past. So if you've got covenants, it's a private form of lesser government, you can still enforce those in your, your HOA or whatever it is. Those kind of covenants are now illegal in Vermont going forward, but you, those are still valid in the past. They're illegal going forward? Illegal going forward. No, you can't do, you can't do covenants going forward, but your covenants that exist pre this law are still okay and are okay going forward. So new developments will not have a HOA? They could, but they won't. The HOA can't require those kind of things. Like, can't say single family homes only. That's can't not illegal to do. Okay. You're going to say something. This entire line of questioning. 
Thank, thank you. Sorry. I just want to make sure it was okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I, I, I guess my comment, Todd, is I mean, clearly some of these changes are driven by statute changes in the statute in the past past while. Some of these are changes that are due to concerns from the Planning Council and DRB. Correct. Yes, I, I would assume that most of there's them been a lot of public comment and public concern as well that's gone into these changes. Agreed. Yes. I mean, these have gone through multiple iterations of uh, meetings at the Planning Council level. And as to your point, Don, most of these are things where the Planning Council wrote new rules and uh, a unique situation comes up where it's a corner lot. And how do we deal with the corner lot? Does the primary entrance go on this side or that side or both sides? And some of these corrections for primary entrance details just that the primary entrance goes on the corner lots example where the sidewalk is. If there's one sidewalk, it goes on that side. If there's two sidewalks on the, on the corner lot, two entrances. So it gives that kind of specificity. Every time you write rules, there's always a what if and a always there's, you can't accommodate for every possible situation. You get one, the DRB says help and the planning council who usually, there's usually one member often at the end attends DRB and says, hey, we can fix that. So most of these are DRB clarifications from this last year. I was gonna say, I, I was involved in a lot of these on DRB where uh, when we were doing permits, issues came up that we realized that we needed a right. um, I just, I, I guess the point of my, my statement more than a question was that there, the public concerns and public co comment are substantial here as well. That there's been a lot of uh, public comment. Yes, this, this is not public, the uh, public input in, into these changes. This is not the first iteration of these changes. Uh, people who routinely attend the planning meetings, like Tom, who attend your meetings, has probably heard these. Probably this is your fourth time, Tom. Not fifth, maybe. So yes, this is the uh, this is the finish line, not the starting line for all these changes. They're all been very public and all been, uh, I think, pretty well vetted at this point. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other board questions before I? Turn it over to the audience. I was just curious about the 490.5 about the string holiday or string lights. You explained that before. Could you I would do love that to let again? Laura explain that, but I'll take a shot first. So uh, with a lot of Laura's help, we're uh, adding some uh, extra allowances to string lights. Right now, under the old rules, uh, I'll use me as an example. I'm a very bad person. I have string lights on my back deck and I use them in the summer. I think they're festive and they're wonderful and no one seems to mind them. However, they're illegal. You can't have string lights in Morrisville or Morristown outside the months, the holiday months of October through January. So come February 1st until September 30th, those string lights are illegal. They're supposed to be off. They can still hang, but they can't be illuminated. Um, mine are on a timer. They're, they may or may not have been illuminated during the summer. <coughs> this allows the string lights to be illuminated with certain criteria and safeguards. For example, the string lights have to be off by 10 o'clock at night. So they should, can't be shining in your neighbor's windows in theory. They have to be on a structure that can't be strung way up in the trees and they've got to be located outside of setbacks. So if you had a, a, a property with a garage that's tight to the neighbor's property line, that's an old house, you can't put the string lights, even the garage is there, you can't put the lights on that side of the garage. So the string lights are off by 10, they're on structures, not up in the trees, and they're out of setbacks, so pretty simple. So it allows, I think probably if you look around town, about half the houses in town probably have string lights, or at least a third of the houses, and this legalizes what many of us, if not maybe a majority of us already have and do. The other side of that coin is if you're going to find a zoning minister in July at 930 at night in the summer to go and force against every string light in town, you need extra help. And I need a lot more help, and I don't really want to do that. A 10 o'clock drive around for compliance is not on my list of things to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board questions? Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> or yours? I have a question. Why not? Oh. I want to introduce yourself, please. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Jan Paris. My question pertains to uh, Section 450, the minimum parking requirement for one parking space per unit. So I guess my first question is, is that an edict that's in place by the state and we cannot overrule? Yes, correct. So there's nothing we say can say anything about that. That's a done deal. That's a done deal. Okay. That's part of your, so you had to talk to your legislators on that change. That was yeah. part of S100 last year. So even though you could have, for example. No, I got all that. that that's good. Eight bedrooms, five bedrooms, three bedrooms each. 24 bedrooms is only going to be eight parking spots of that eight bedroom, three unit, three right. bedroom each. So right. some 24 spaces is eight spaces. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of a ridiculous thing. And it's unfortunate for the people that rent or live in these areas to think that only one space because most people are, you know, husband and wife or whatever. Yeah, and, 
Exactly. So now they're left in a lurch. I mean, where, where's the wife going to park her car or where am I going to park my truck? You know, so that's all. But if it can't be changed, that's fine. Right. Yes, it can be changed. Outside the core of downtown, we've always required two parking spaces per unit, but the state has now made that illegal. So yeah. this is our first first uh, foray into the Homes for Everyone Act because parking apparently makes housing more expensive. So we're, limit, we're limited to one space per unit under state law. Every town Vermont has to make that change. State laws can ch be changed also. Yes, Contact your legislator. Talk to your legislator. I'm expecting the super majority of that doesn't work. No. I am hoping that um, the planning council will be looking at S100, including that part. Well, the parking change will be done, but all of S100 will be worked on during the winter, during the coming legislative session. So if there are any changes to that law, which is pretty far sweeping, and most people aren't aware of that law, will be able to respond to it. So the timing will work out well because we'll still be live while the legislature has a second bite at the apple if they so choose. And I've heard it might happen, but who knows until it happens. Thank you. Well, come on up. I'd just like to talk clarify something. No, just come on, up, come on up to the microphone and introduce yourself, please. My name is Bob Medito. I live in the Jersey Heights. The town can't require you to have more than one spot. That's what this is saying? Correct. But you can have as many spots as you want. Correct. We don't have a maximum, just we can't, the minimum is that. Okay. There is uh, one question on Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, Carly's iPad. Um, hi, Kathy Chafee. So Todd, um, is, this the, is this the meeting where you um, had, um, uh, where you put Park Street on the historic street list? Yes, that's correct. Under section 207, the only change in 207 is adding Park Street into that uh, historic preservation zone. So uh, Park Street will apply uh, the sections in the historic district. So there's a small section of Park Street. It doesn't go all the way out to the rail trail bridge. It's a short section of Park Street. It's in the village. So you get to the bottom of the hill, you go up to the, uh, once you get up the hill towards the elementary school, you're outside of the regulatory zone. Um, I don't know where to find where uh, the list is of historic streets, but is Copley Avenue one of them? Copley Avenue is not. The Planning Council has not chosen to regulate that street under Section 207 to the, at this juncture. Well, is it the, the, the school at the bottom of the hill historic and the school at the top historic? Classified uh, those, 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 are both, those are both historic buildings, yes, but they have not given that street the same regulatory protections as right now, Jump in if I'm missing anything, Wally or Etienne. The historic preservation criteria applies to Portland, Lower Maine, small section of Upper Maine, Pleasant, Hutchins. Bridge. Bridge, small section of Bridge, Route 100 section, and the Route 100 section of Brooklyn Street partially we did last year. What did I miss? Anything? And now if, now if the zoning is approved, Park Street. Um, can somebody on the board explain why they don't feel that Copley Avenue should be his, on the historic list? Um, it's un, that's planning's purview that would come through us. I mean, that's, I'd, I'd agree with you. Yeah, Laura. you you would um, need to talk to planning, and then it'll um, they'll yes. go through the whole process. And it, here's the man to speak about it. Etienne Hancock, uh, Planning Council. Uh, we we certainly could add districts in the future, or streets rather, in the future if we chose. And if there was considerable public support for it. At the moment, at this time, we were targeting just the downtown area that's been subject to so much development. And uh, at the moment, I don't see that, or we don't see the push for development on Copley Ave or redevelopment of existing buildings. Does it have to do at all with the age of the buildings when you say it's historic? Uh, there's a, it's actually a state, uh, the, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the. Morrisville Historic District. The Morrisville Historic District was established by a state uh, agency report uh, in the 80s, I believe. 1987, I believe it's the first. And so there's a full report that basically identifies every structure that they consider historic within the village limits. Uh, many of those still exist, quite a few are gone now. Uh, so last year, this is again, what we did last year, not this year, is simply tried to provide some protection to those existing buildings on again, Main Street, Portland Street, Corridor, Pleasant, Hutchins, Lower Bridge, to try to preserve the street that we, the streetscape that we all know, the buildings that we all know in the face of pretty significant development. 
So again, we could in the future add others if there's public support for doing so. And in particular, if we see a lot of pressure on those other streets. What's the benefit? Well, um, without that kind of protection, anybody can buy a lot and tear down any building if they so choose. Okay. Um, and and also, um, wouldn't that include if if it was a, his, a historic street that any buildings that would be on that would have to follow your historic uh, new buildings? Like, I'm just kind of concerned for Copley Avenue because the lot between me and Mr. Fischel, I'm 100% sure it's probably sold. And it was advertised as nine apartment units going in there. So with nine and the four that's there, that's 13 units. And then say Mr. Fischel sold his house and a, and a, and a, and a builder bought it and put more apartments there. Um, say in five years, I sold my house and, and, a, and a builder bought it. And the, then the whole side, right hand side of this road could be all apartments and it's on a historic street. That's just why I'm asking. No, that's a very uh, good example. And um, at the moment, uh, just the, if they did turn into multifamily units, they would be subject to the 206 design criteria, which is really meant to regulate those, what, it, what becomes a public multifamily building. Uh, so there's a, a slew of, of requirements that the developer would have to meet for those particular buildings. Uh, this year, I believe we added some of the DRV specific language about having uh, full corner boards hiding vinyl trim, vinyl siding, for example. Um, <clears throat> your question is a good one and your concern is a good one. Um, tonight, though, that is not on the docket, but it could be next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I just, I was just curious because if both schools are historic and the street isn't, that just, that confused me. So I guess I'll pay attention to next year when you're doing this and I'll come see you. Thank okay. you. Anyone else from the audience? I see no other hands. I see no other hands on the, oh, Tommy? Yes, uh, this is a Nancy Donovan. I've got a question. If we're adding ADUs to existing house lots, how is that gonna impact the fire department with getting um, fire engines down the street with extra cars if there's not an allowed spot for them to park off the street. Jenny? Well, I'm not going to keep the fire chief sitting two rows behind me. Well, Could you answer the question? I didn't understand it. I think she's worried about fire department access in, in relation to any new development. It's going to be you An AUD. If a AUD is accessory ADUs. Yeah. So there's another apartment on a piece of property. How does the fire department access that especially, property? Especially if it's not an apartment or no, no. Oh, yeah. I'm asking if if there's not dedicated parking off street and because there doesn't have to be, how is that gonna impact the fire department trying to get down a street that's cluttered with all extra cars with trying to fight a fire? My name's Dennis. I'm the fire chief. Do you want my honest answer? Yeah. I'll push him out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> There's also. Um, I have no uh, problem. We got big bumpers. We have not been to a place yet. We have not been able to access <laughs> all the new buildings that have been built. I've had a hand in as far as the size of their parking lots limited in parking spaces so we can get our trucks in there. <clears throat> and I've turned down a couple buildings because we had no way of getting to the third floor on one side with the ladder. So I see all the drawings of all the new buildings. I talk with Todd, me and the engineer, kind of on first name basis, because he knows what we want. But in reality, we have no problem pushing a gate open, uh, moving cars out of the way, because PD is usually there first. And to me, it's life safety, and I'll worry about what happens to me after. But we will get to your building. I don't know if that helps you or not. Yeah, that's why I was curious, because if we have these extra cars and they're parking on both sides of the street 
um, not all of the streets in town are particularly wide. And that's what I wondered is if you have everyone on the street adding a ADU to their lot and they're not required to have the parking on the lot, those are those are cars parking out in the street. Well, I know if they start adding them kind of apartments, now you're going to a state level. And it's going to trump anything zoning or DRB has because now you're going by state because you're talking really life safety. Thank you, Thank you Debbie. Chief. Yeah, Chief and I work very closely together in every site plan for every proposed development. The one thing I'll add is if this, you're adding an ADU, they're required to add a parking space. Every dwelling unit is required to have a parking space. So if there's a unit being added, there's a parking space being added. So we're not at a loss for parking because it's an ADU. They're gonna. They have to add. The, they have to add a parking space. And we one per one per unit. ADU is a unit. And we currently have the um, parking ban during the winter, so Correct. you can't park on the city streets during the winter anyway. So, so at night you're safe. <laughs> okay. Anyone else from the audience? Anyone else from uh, on Zoom? Mitzi, is that a hand up? No, I don't think so. Never mind. <clears throat> so it looks as if we close the hearing. Okay. You may want to actually, I would recommend you leave the hearing open. Okay. Uh, to perfect the zoning change, you and the trustees have come up with the exact same language. You have an, a, a meeting with the trustees next week. Uh, I would highly encourage you to leave the hearing open and so you can talk to the trustees and say, hey, what are you concerned with? What are you concerned with? What can we move forward with together? What may have to be left on the sidelines because we can't quite get to the same common ground on that issue. So I'd encourage you to leave the hearing open, still uh, talk to the trustees about it next week and hopefully you guys can find common ground. This is all pretty straightforward stuff. Hopefully it's all common ground or at least 95% of it's common ground, you move forward from there. So okay. do it, keep it open until next week. You can close it at the end of the uh, joint hearing and then you're voting on it November 1st and 6th. So as of right now, the way the calendar falls, the trustees will vote first on the on November first, and the select board is scheduled to vote second on the sixth. Uh, you can talk to the mm -hmm. trustees about that order if you like. If you'd like to act first, you can ask them to act on the sixteenth, the fifteenth instead, at their next regular meeting. But you can't vote at the next meeting. You have to come find common ground. You have to vote your next regular meeting. You stat what's what statute says. So okay. come November, hopefully we can approve these and approve some sort of common language. So we can adjourn, but we're just not going to close the hearing. Correct. You keep the hearing open. Okay. And I think we're satisfied with the agenda item and we'll go on to the next one. Okay. Thank you. So I would um, entertain a motion to adjourn this part of the meeting. So, uh, Judy, what I would do is um, I would uh, make the motion to recess this hearing until um, our regularly worn meeting on October 25th with the trustees. Okay. I have a motion? Yes. I need a second. I'll second that. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion has passed. And we're ready to move into um, liquor and tobacco control board. I'd like to call that meeting to order. Um, thank you. Thank you. Judy, we had one uh, item on the agenda. They have since removed that, so we have nothing. So we can go ahead and adjourn. Okay. So I'd like to um, ask for a motion to adjourn the Liquor Control Board. So moved. A second? All second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, we've been adjourned from Liquor Control. Thank you. Next, we'll open the agenda of the meeting for the select board at whatever time it is, 6.07. Any agenda changes or additions to the agenda? We got a couple. Uh, number five, approve and sign clear release for Duhamel parking lot. That can be um, deleted for this week. We'll put that back on in two weeks or the meeting in November. And then number nine, approve the lease for the holder sidewalk machine. That actually needs to say approve the financing and purchase of the holder sidewalk machine. Can somebody shut the door? Thank you. Or ask them to move on. Yeah, we should ask them. Yeah, to move on. leave the door open. Thank you. Sorry, it's just just ask them to move on.
I'm sorry. Um, yeah, let let leave the door open, door. please. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And then one last addition uh, under executive session. Right now we have personnel, contract, legal, and we need to add labor. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to um, ask for motion to approve the minutes from October 2nd, 2023. I would move that. I need a, a motion and a second. I'll make a motion to approve the- No, uh, we got a motion, just uh, a oh, second. second. Okay, great. Uh, any discussion? I, yes. Oh, hold on one second. Um, I'd like to add that under uh, call select board meeting to order that I also talked about Brian's service to the fire department for 20 years. If we could add that in that first paragraph. And there was another one, I think. Um, Oh, on uh, old business, number one, approved social service policy. Um, the last sentence, the major changes to the policy are the requirement for an annual application. I think we removed that from the policy, I thought. We didn't? They, oh, they oh, all, oh. They all fill out the application. It's a one sheet. Oh, okay, it's not. I'm thinking of. Um, I'm thinking of something. Yeah, they're gonna petition. Yes, yeah. I am. Petition okay. Is not part of that. All right, never mind. Um, page. Uh, community comments. Um, Martin Green expressed his concerns about select board attentiveness. It, it basically was that he felt that we weren't we we're not paying attention to the report being read. So that's what. That was about. Those are my thoughts on the minutes. Anybody else from the board? Okay. Um, Want to come up? Yeah. I just have a question on the uh, on the change of, for the uh, the plow there that we purchased instead of the lease. Is it? Is this part of the minutes? This is. No, this is what he said earlier. It's an agenda. <laughs> it's it's an agenda. We're, we're, yeah, we'll get to that later. But we're going to do. We're doing the minutes right now. Okay. 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 okay sure. Um, it's not. In Tell the us what you are. Alex here you are within Morristown. Sorry, um, I had a comment um, in the public comments last time, uh, encouraging the um, select board to take affirmative steps to ensure that the. Funding for Noise House doesn't go to zero in any particular year. Um, and that just got let out. So. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. All right, any other discussion? So, um, Judy, yes. uh, what I'll do is uh, amend the motion to um, <laughs> approve the minutes um, with the addition to Mr. Sears' uh, comments in the public comment okay. section. So right. that, that becomes part of the new minutes. Okay. Did you all get that? <coughs> I did. Uh, Chris, just so I can clarify. Yep. So when I do the minutes, I do accept, approve the minutes with amendments. Okay. okay. And I have the changes, and I'll put those down below. So that's how I do it every time when I do the minutes. Perfect. Is that all right? Yep. Perfect. Right. Thanks. Excellent. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Minutes have been. Oops, all right. And Don has abstained. Okay. New business. Number one, accept the resignation of Richard Sargent from Morristown Conservation Commission. <coughs> Does someone want to speak to that? Uh, Ron's not here, but this came in uh, about two weeks ago. Richard just doesn't have the time to dedicate to the Conservation Committee, and he asked for a letter of resignation. He sent one in on October 4th. Do we have we have a copy of his uh, in our packet. So. Yeah. yeah. And do we know how many years he served on the commission? I don't. I think it was quite a long time. Yeah. So um, we need a, a motion to accept Richard's resignation. I'll make a motion to accept Richard's resignation and to uh, include a card of thanks. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Moving on, number two, approve errors in the mission certificate. Is 
anyone speaking to that or we just Charles, Charlie, would you like to speak to it? Yes. We do, yeah. Any questions for Charlie? Uh, I would make a motion to accept um, the errors and omissions certificate um, presented this evening. I'll second that. Okay. I have a motion. And... Good. <laughs> Um, uh, a motion and a second. Any discussion? And I would just say that the in both cases we're talking about ten percent or less in the change, and in both cases it was subdivision acreage was incorrect. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed. Number three: approve Christina Young as part-time unbenefited member of Morristown EMS. You want to come up, Bill? Hi, good evening, Bill Mapes, EMS Chief. Uh, Christina Young is a Vermont licensed, uh, nationally registered emergency medical technician um, who has applied for the, what was the, uh, the volunteers that with the new budget is now the part-time unbenefited, less than 23 hours a week positions. Um, we're authorized for up to 15 of those positions. Uh, so she's applied to do that. Uh, uh, I've, I actually know her from uh, working together at another service. She's well qualified. She's also a uh, uh, med search nurse at Copley Hospital. Uh, so she's looking to, uh, to uh, for it to be mutually beneficial, uh, you know, since she's down in this area anyway. All right. Sounds okay. excellent. Thank you. I have a motion. I'll make a motion. We approve adding Christina Young to a part-time paid EMS position, non-benefits, <coughs> and paid at $15 per hour beginning immediately. I will second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I guess I have a question, Bill. Just, just <laughs> kind of wondering. So you just said this is filling up to one of 15 positions. How many of those 15 positions are filled right now? This will be, we had eight, this will be 10. So that's just for the Zoom public, that's 10 out of 15 are filled? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. Just curious. Very good. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion has passed. Welcome aboard, Christina. Uh, adopt records management policy and retention plan. Sarah. I'm really excited to present this tonight. Uh, Sarah Haskins, town clerk. This was my first agenda item to do when I became clerk. It is finally at the board. Um, it's something that we uh, um, were doing anyways. We just didn't have the policy behind what we are actually um, doing. Stephen came from um, the states of Asara <laughs> Records. Um, administration and archives from the state and did a training with staff over the summer helped us write the policy um, it's the standard policy that uh, the state has written uh, we just plugged our name into the spots they've um, the states looked it over said it looks great um, basically it just says how we're going to maintain our records to keep them safe and um, when we're going to dispose of records and that we're going to use the state statutes um, of when we're going to dispose of, of records. Are these records like select board emails, <laughs> like when a select board member leaves? It's everything. So how are they going to be kept? Because that, that, that's a lot of work and storage. Um, I could speak a little yeah, bit. A little so bit we're going to be increasing than. what we pay to our IT company to have that storage. So it's cloud storage, archived cloud storage. Mm. So one of the questions that came up for me is this idea of the retention period. And, and there, it does say in here that in a few instances, VSARA has yet to, to issue a GRS to define the retention period. These documents will be retained until a ruling has been made. And so am I reading that right, that we don't really know how long we need to keep these? Documents? Well, certain documents. 
So like I asked, um, Todd had a great question that came up at our training. Um, the state has now taken over the septic system permits. The town doesn't issue them. We haven't since, I forget the date, maybe 2007. Okay. He has all of these files that no, no longer have any meaning to people because the state does it all. So he had me inquire with the state to see if we could dispose of them because they're taking up all these room and now the state maintains them. And the state, so the answer we got back was they haven't determined yet whether or not there's use and value in them. Um, and so until they have issued a retention schedule for that type of record, we have their permanent record and we have to keep them. That's, that's, so, how, that's how I interpret that piece. So in general, we're saving things for perpetuity. Not everything. Um, there are some that are very clear. What's the election retention, that's just I know so well, so that's what I'm going to speak of. Um, those are really great. They rewrote them. They're very clear. I know local election, the checklist, the ballots, anything to do with a town special meeting, 90 days. I keep it for 90 days. After 90 days, I dispose of it all. A federal election, um, it's 22 months. So the absentee ballot request, the ballots, everything with a federal is 22 months. So. The state hasn't gone through everything, but they've been slowly going through and saying, this is how long you have to keep dog licenses. This is how long you have to keep tax receipts. This is how long you have to keep grants. And then the town can go through and say, all right, here's the um, GRS for the state. It says that we have to um, keep grants for at least three years, but the town can set, has to go by that minimum, but we can say, there's historic value in that grant application and we don't wanna destroy it for three years. So we're gonna um, maintain them for seven years or we're gonna maintain them for 25 years or so we can, um, we can make our retention larger than what the state requirement is, but we can't make it smaller. And then if we get a public record request, I'm kind of skipping to a new policy mm -hmm. further down. Um, and somebody asks for a document, they want the grant from 2007, we can say our retention policy that's been approved, we only keep our grants for seven years, therefore we've destroyed it. And it will even say we're going to shred it or we're going to recycle it. Or in some instances, it could be you can turn it over to the historical society if you think. So can I also ask, um, and Tina might join in on this uh, as far as financial i'm sure we're, we're under the irs guidelines about so that the state would have taken when the state yeah. creates their um their retention schedules they're they're up. going and they're looking at federal law and they're give they're looking at state law yeah and they're doing all that that homework for us do you, do you oh, see it causing us uh, an issue of, of space of retaining some of this information well, no, because if we don't have this policy, we're not supposed to throw away anything. Oh, okay. So right. now, so it'll free up space. Yeah, I would think that now they have the freedom and we'll, there will be more of a routine of when mm -hmm. we get rid of stuff. We'll, we'll probably have stuff sitting around. So we I went, need. so we've been, follow, we've mm -hmm. been doing this for years, like since I've started, we've been doing this. Mm -hmm. We fought, we follow them. If we have a question, we like go and look to see what, um, we do. Um, I was fortunate and they're, they do, I don't know if they're monthly now, they might be quarterly. I went and did a tour of the Vermont Records Administration and I got to see like the state archives and how they're doing the retention for the state. It's pretty amazing like how they, how they have everything structured and um, with retention dates. So having this policy means that we would have less of a burden when it comes to retention mm -hmm. and simplify happen. and then there's no question about oh do i have to keep this do i not because then we could say oh that's the that's the retention the state says and so we have don't a schedule have to... of getting rid of stuff i would assume mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i know schools have a, a schedule with the mm -hmm. student records that they every so many years they can get purged those files mm -hmm. Do you have the option to scan it and keep it electronically, or do you have to actually keep the paper piece? A lot of it, we have to keep the actual paper. Hard copies? Yeah, the, ori the original. Okay. So do you have to keep a record of the disposition as well? Like if 
what dog licenses from 1997 do you have to say that they were destroyed and then have somewhere where you know they were destroyed on a certain date or is that you do not just have they're gone? so you can if you would like to but you do not have to that was a question that that we asked you they the state said as long as you have your your um your policy so yeah your policy and then here's your little um checklist of you know this is we're gonna have checklist this this long check stubs so then you can just pull this out and it, if it's says the timeline and it's past that timeline then then that's okay okay is every department res have responsible or is there one one department that's responsible for great question getting rid of the <laughs> So far, it's sort of been each department is doing their own. I think um, most of the most, but not all of the departments kind of look to the clerk's office and to Mitzi Elizabeth and I for guidance, just because um, we're the we're the keepers of the records and a lot of the stuff goes into the vault. But we're more of the keepers of the the official, the ones that we have to keep forever, and less of the transitory um doc documents like i'm not i'm not keeping track of emails for other departments so going forward are we assuming that each department will now have its own schedule and someone responsible for mm -hmm. deleting this or upkeep i should say any other questions any questions from the audience one up does this include? So introduce yourself, please. Include you. does, it, does this include like the emails and the, the, so what's the time period now to hang on to this stuff? It depends on the content of the email. <laughs> Who decides that? The state statue. So you have to, <laughs> it's very complicated. So you have to read what the state says. Is it somebody that just emailed you? Thank you. Can I have a copy of my tax bill? No. Is it, is it more, is there more substantive, you know, have you given um, an opinion about something that you need to keep or you're, you know, emailing a copy of a loan document back and forth? Yeah. That's a bad example, but I'm yeah. like it. It, de it really depends on the content and a lot, you know, correspondence you get through the mail and letters that you send. It all de depends on is it who is decides it the, that the state. No, who decides here whether in here whether the state mandates you keep it or the state the or state, you can get if rid the of state it. says you do it, you do it. I think yeah, he's asking who ooh. determines the value of the content read. right now. Yes. So if, at the moment, it's been department heads. Heads. So you would be. I'm not a department head. Who was? Who's no, the I head think it would come down to the board. town administrator or the town manager. They're the ones that are in charge of the daily operations of the town. Okay. So I would say that's in a more of an operations. So it'd be you, you, whoever's you. in this seat. Yeah. Okay. You need a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion that we approve the records management policy and retention plan for the town of Morristown as presented. I'll second that. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Just thank you, Sarah. This is thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed. The records management policy and retention plan has been accepted. Moving to number six, approve a five year contract with Mudget, Janet, and Crow Wisner. Wisner? Wisner, I was first auditors. No, Paul. Um, tell us who we you are. Just, hi, uh, Tina Sweet, finance director. We just recently completed our audit, which was the last year of the contract with our auditors. And I asked her if she would give us um, another contract for your consideration. They only raised the price two hundred and fifty dollars from last year to this year, and it increases two hundred and fifty each year through the five years, as long as we don't have a single audit again. Um, it's also increasingly hard to find auditors that audit books like ours because a lot of them don't have the employees anymore. They really have a hard time staffing this. So some of them have closed down. Some of them have ju are just doing like taxes and stuff. So I really felt like we work very well together
there. They are very thorough. Um, it didn't seem to be a burden for us to deal with her in any way. And I thought that it was a, the be in the best interest of the town that we do this. Is there a benefit for the town in having the same auditor come back every year? Absolutely. Um, the benefit is, is that if you hire a new auditor, there's a lot of work that you have to do on the front end and a lot of research they have to do on the front end to you know get acclimated to what the town does and what their procedures and policies are and if you use the same auditor then they already know that so it, it makes the audit shorter that's why i think that we were able to keep the cost down so much so shorter and less expensive yes so Thank you. just for uh technicality this um as far as our policies for do we require a minimum of three bids for anything? And I'm assuming this does not fall under any kind of requirement for additional bids. We have gone out to bid in the past with this, but you don't have to. That's and I felt point. given the shortage of auditors that it would be a waste of time to try to do that. Plus it would cost the town a lot more money to break in a new auditor again. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we weren't. No, we're not. you can always waive that. You don't have to do that. And I, I would like you to share, if you would, the story about the auditors contacting you when they're auditing other places. Um, this this particular auditor audits a lot of towns, and you can, towns obviously do things differently. And so sometimes when she's at other towns, she will call me and say, "Well, what did you do with this?" Because you know there are different ways of doing it that are all correct. And so she sometimes asks my advice on how we did it and why so that she can advise others of other ways of doing things very impressive thank you tina so i um, looking for a motion uh, i would make a motion um, to uh, enter into a five-year contract for fiscal years 2024 through 2028 uh, with auditors budget janet crow and wisner PC for a price of $20,250 for the fiscal year 2024 and increasing $250 per year. You know, we treat this as a single contract um, bid. I have a second. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hold on. Anybody on board? Okay. Hi, Alex here. I live in Morristown. I was wondering if there's any law or policy setting a maximum length of time that a town in Vermont can work with the same auditor. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I was wondering if there's any law or policy in Vermont setting the maximum time a town can work with the same auditor. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. The answer was not that we are aware of. And I'm, I'm just repeating this because I will say, when I tried to Zoom that meeting two weeks ago, <clears throat> it was so hard to hear people. So when Judy does ask you to come to the mic, it's really important. If you're not close to that mic, you're not heard up there. Which I couldn't hear much. Thank you, Don. Uh, Tom, Claudia, I, I, I would recommend and ask that, it, that we do send out a, a, a bit for three more bids. I mean, uh, this is pretty important. And, and, getting the same order year after year, although it might be faster and a little cheaper, doesn't necessarily mean it's better. So I, I would think just to look to see what is out there. I know it might be a little bit difficult, but it might be worth the time to take and, uh, and to see what new order to, uh, would come in. No telling that maybe there's something that we're doing, uh, uh, missing out a little bit that we could get money for by, uh, by a new order that would pick up. I don't know, there's just a lot of different things and we wouldn't know. So anyway, just looking for even a cost benefit uh, wouldn't hurt to get two more estimates on it. So. Thank you. Okay. You want to speak to that? Um, I, I'll just um, assure you that even though there's one lady that comes here to do our audit, it has to go through like two or three other people in their office that are also CPAs. So it's not like one person is doing it all. And what they're doing is they are verifying that we have followed all the government standards for what we do and how we do business. It's not to find money or to, you know, it's just to verify that what we're doing is correct. It's your accounting practice. That that, that's right. And 
internal controls and that kind of thing so that they can identify if there's anything that we're doing incorrectly with internal controls that could be a liability to the town things like that they're just making sure we're doing our jobs right yeah. thank you okay you want to go? Right, jerry throne uh following up on tom's question um is there an expiration on the uh, quote that we received from the auditors. In other words, is there a certain amount of time uh, under which if we don't act that the price is no longer valid? I'm not aware of that. She didn't put a time limit on it. Um, I, you know, but I didn't, I do know that she said that she needed to make sure if we were going to do it that she had an answer soon because she's already scheduling people for next year and she needs to leave our slot open if we're going to do it she needs to just pencil us in because they're getting tons of clients that want them to do their audits and you know they're having to turn people away so that's a concern don't, don't we, um, have you found that when you entered into this contract five years ago, the price, um, how did it vary from five, year ago, five years ago to today? Do you, do you know that? I don't know offhand, really. I mean, the, the contract we had before this one was a three-year contract. Um, and this year's audit was different because it was a single audit. So that obviously costs more than a regular, we don't normally have single audits, but because of the ARPA grant, we were required to do that, and that's why this year's audit cost more money. So that's what triggered the single audit? Yes. It's, if you spend more than $750,000 of federal funds in a fiscal year, you have to have a single audit. And I know, Tina, that um, in the last six years, we've had a different, we had a different auditor. We've, we've had, let's see, we had, when I first started here, um, we had this this audit firm for quite a few years and we would what we would do is we would change partners um one year this lady might do it and the next year somebody else from their office would do it just so that we got different people so that you know it didn't get complacent which is i think kind of what they do now anyway and then we had um sullivan powers for a couple of years um then we had uh, uh glenna pound for a few years um and then when we went back out to bid, we selected these people again, even though they weren't the cheapest because they were the easiest to work with and the most thorough. Um, we've had problems in the past with some of our audits I felt were not thorough. I felt that they weren't looking at everything they should be looking at. And so that's why I recommended to you this audit firm that we're with right now. Thank you. Um, uh, Kathy? Um, Kathy Chafee, I just want to um, let Tom know that um, that's not unusual to keep an auditor. Um, we've had the same auditor where I worked for the last nine years, and we probably had him longer. So it's not uncommon to keep the same auditor. Thank you. <laughs> um, Evelyn Marsville. Um, what are the, I'm not quite aware of this whole thing. So what are, what is the um, downside to having an, an audit that is not, not as thorough as it might be if you have made a, um, if you haven't followed some kind of state rule, what, um, what can, what problems can occur from that? I'm going to let Tina answer that. Uh, one of the big things that can happen, well, one of our auditors, this is a small thing, but it bothered me greatly. Um, they're supposed to go through and do a sampling of all of your checks that you write and pick out certain ones that they trace from getting the check, making sure that the right um, signatures are on it to approve writing the check, seeing the check that's cashed at the bank, looking at it at the bank statement. I mean, they go through everything. And one of our auditors was picking two and three dollar checks, which I felt was not a very good representation when the town spends hundreds of thousands of dollars in salt and different things like that. So I felt like that was not um, as thorough as it should have been. And if they if they don't um, 
do it in all those steps like that, we may have a problem with internal controls. Like for example, somebody cannot sign checks and balance the checkbook, uh, balance a bank statement. That is a total no-no. That's why we have the breakdown between the town clerk's office and our office, because like I do the uh, reconciliation of the bank statements, but Sarah has to sign them. So they're very good internal controls. And if somebody is not concerned with that or looking at that, I mean, you, you could potentially have fraud. So that's why it's so important to get a good firm that is very, you know, thorough at what they do. You don't want to be put in a position where, you know, you don't really know what's going on. I think we've heard pretty compelling uh, testimony tonight uh, in favor of this audit uh, department. I think that there is great value and consistency, uh, particularly because they're familiar with the controls that are in place. Um, I would like to, uh, I've made the motion, I think that- We have a second to- I would yeah. like to move forward with that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And moving on to number seven. So the motion has been approved to uh, contract with uh, Mudget, Janet, Crow, and Wisner for the auditors. Uh, number seven, approve renewal of 2024 health reimbursement account, the HRA. I guess Tina's up again. I'm up again. Um, this is something that we do every year um, because we have chosen to have a low um, premium plan for our health insurance we chose to do an HRA to help uh, defray some of the costs of the deductibles because the deductible is so high. Um, in doing that, we are basically putting money into a fund that is owned by the town and they only take the money out when actually somebody actually uses it. So if you fund that at $200,000, you may only spend you know, 125 of that 200,000 and the rest is still town money. You make interest off it and everything else, but yeah, it does. It helps the employees to be able to afford the deductibles. And every year when they have their new rates come out, of course, they always increase the out of pocket maximums. Um, and historically, the town has always paid half of whatever the out of pocket maximum or pledged half of the out of pocket maximum to an HRA and then if it's a if it's a family plan, a two person plan or a adult and child plan, they add another thousand to that for the other family members. And that's what you're seeing in front of you right now. Um, and just because we fund it at that level does not mean we're paying for it. It just means that we are pledging that if somebody had something catastrophic happen in their family, they would get the full 10,450, which hardly ever happens. And I'll tell you that um, this year we funded the HRA at 50%. So I figured out what 100% of the liability would, would be, but we funded it at 50% because we had money in the HRA fund already. So we don't wanna you know, keep growing that fund ridiculously. So we only funded it at 50%. So I only funded $143,000 in that fund. And I just put it in there. So we haven't spent all that money. And I've never seen a I've never seen a year where we have spent it all. And then it just rolls over to the next year, which in turn will lower the Okay. Uh, what happens is, is somebody will go to the doctors, the doctor will, will char charge their Blue Cross insurance. Chances are the person will get a letter in the mail from the doctor saying, you haven't reached your deductible. You owe us X amount of dollars. And I always tell them, do not pay that because at the same time, Blue Cross issues that, that notice to the doctor that we haven't received our deductible. They also send that claim directly to our HRA. And there's a time lag, but the HRA plan will cut a check to the doctor. So we're not involved in it. The employee is not involved in it. It happens automatically through Blue Cross Blue Shield. I just have to say, you know, knowing that the schools are doing the same thing, that 
it works out very well for the employer. Well, just so that you know, I, I looked at this year, we, we have the standard bronze plan and how much the town paid for that. And if we had done a higher deductible plan like the gold plan, we would have spent $170,000 more on the gold plan than we did on the plan that we're on just in premiums. So, it, you know, it, it can be very worthwhile. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. How much are we going to put in this year? We're putting in 143,000. It'll be, yeah, it'll be a, a little bit more next year because um, the, the prices have gone up. But um, I don't anticipate I I don't anticipate having to ever to do much more than fifty percent funding. We may even be able to cut it down to forty five or forty percent in future years, depending on. It all depends on how many people are sick and what they claim and that kind of thing. So some people never go to the doctors and they never pay anything. So. And so just out of curiosity, this is sitting in a, a savings account? It's sitting in a checking account that this HRA company has access to, and they pull out the exact dollar amount of what they have paid in your behalf every week. Oh, so it's a checking, but is it an interest bearing? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's what you said. It was. Yes, there is interest bearing too. So can I have a motion? Looking for an amendment. I move to, I'll move to authorize the renewal of for the 2024 HRA with levels of $10,450 for two person, adult plus child or children and family plans and $4,700 for all other plans. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <clears throat> okay. uh, Jerry Throne. Uh, just so I understand, because I'm getting familiar, trying to get familiar with how the government expenses are, are occurring. Um, is this HRA something that the union requires of the employees, that the, the town pay for the employees? So this yeah. is something that the, uh, the town has offered the employees to help uh, get them to work here. Okay, I thank think, you. I'm assuming there's other, other municipalities and other um, state employees that get the same benefit. Okay, like, thank yeah, you. Don't Don't just I just wanna be careful, is it? Is this part of the contract? It is with the police department yeah. so, with, and the highway. With so. the highway department and therefore okay. with the longevity so, pay policy. Well, I was wrong. Originally, it was not part of any union contract. The select board opted to do this. And when they did, when people renewed their union contracts, this information was put in there with the clause that says the select board can change the dollar amount of the funding if they want to. So it is in the union contract as a benefit. Thank you. Right. And it's all based on the fact that we have a high deductible yes. insurance plan. Yes. Yeah. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion is passed. Okay. Approved payroll software program. Are you up again, Tina? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, as you know, we've been looking for a payroll software uh, company that can process our payroll more automatically. Um, this, we researched a couple of different ones, had actually we went to St. Albans City and viewed their software in action to see how it was. Um, it's extremely time saving. It takes her an hour to process 100 people's paychecks. It takes us three days. Oh, wow. <laughs> because all of ours is manual. You have to add it all up. If you're missing something, you have to chase people down. And um, this software is, um, I had budgeted 24000 a year for it because I didn't really know. And some softwares are pretty expensive. But as you can see, this is coming in at 13000 Is that, and how many employees? How many um, is there a so, maximum number? No, there's not a maximum. They charge you per employee. So that's just a, a guess based on what we've told them we have for people that are employees. So we are charged per employee. Yes, yeah. for any payroll software that's you okay. are. The best thing about this software is, is that it also has a human resource component, which currently we don't have any kind of human resources anything. And um, that's going to be very, very helpful for the human resource person. Um, it's it's just really slick. Everything is done um, by an app, either on your phone or on the computer or whatever. And you can 
Um, it has geo tracking. So like all the guys at the highway garage can't like punch in at home. They have to go to the shop to punch in where they'll get their trucks and stuff. Um, so you can turn that on or off. Um, they'll put in their time and it'll go to their supervisor immediately. And the supervisor can approve time off if they're requesting it. They can approve their hours and they sign off on it. And then it comes to us and we go through it one last time to make sure nothing looks crazy. And then we send it off to the company who writes all the checks, does all the direct deposits, does all the quarterly reports, does all the quarterly payments for taxes, does the W-2s, they do everything. They even do COBRA paperwork um, for HR. So it, it, it they do a lot and it'll save us a ton of time. Is this the same company that St. Albans was using? St. Albans City. City, this, this yes. is? Yes. Um, also <clears throat> St. Johnsbury uses that, VLCT uses it. Um, Georgia, I think, uses it a lot. They are a well-known presence and they get great reviews because people say it doesn't matter when you call them, they're right there to help and they know what they're doing. So that's worth quite a bit and it'll save money in the budget, um, but I'll be coming back to you for some other cool stuff that St. Albans has that I think can save us having to hire more people. So, um, Did you look at other payroll companies? Yes, I did. I looked at ADP. They're a big, big, big company, and they actually have great software. It looks really good, but they don't really have a lot of experience with Vermont municipalities or any for that matter. And I just felt like because they were more expensive and these municipalities have been using this software for years, that it would be behoove us to go with the cheaper one that has been proven that it works well. This eliminates paper, so no more oh, time so cards. No more time cards. No. Is there going to be a training? Uh, are you going to have to have a training uh, period with the department heads? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely so. We have, so. Um, where's that cost going to go in? It's all included in the price. of their. So they'll come in and do the training? Yep. Okay. Cool. I'd like to entertain a motion. I'll, I'll move to approve a three-year contract with Paychex Payroll Human Resources software at a price of $13,900.20 annually and authorize Jason Luno, interim town administrator, to sign the contract. And a second? I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I do have, um, when will this, will this go into our fiscal year? How will we cycle this? Are they going to come in mid-year? What we're planning to do is is have them come in as soon as possible because they need to get all of the information that we have now into their system. I'd like to run dual systems with the one we have and this one um, for a couple of months to make sure there are no problems. And then we're uh -huh. cutting the old system loose on January 1st. So when when will I'm just wondering, like when when will the typical of uh, the financial, um, you know, so that we're not trying to change contracts in the middle of a fiscal year. Well, you see what I mean? it's best to um, do something like this with payroll at the beginning of a calendar year because calendar everything year. runs calendar year with W-2s and stuff. That's why okay. I wanted to start at January 1. That answered it. Thank you. Excellent. Any other discussion? Right. Jerry Throne. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I just have a couple of quick questions having uh, looked at what's in your packets. Uh, on the proposal. Um, so the, I guess the motion is to approve the 13,900, but at the bottom of the, uh, of, the, of the proposal sheet says first year total is 14,900. So I guess there's an additional uh, fee for the first year. Uh, just set up cost. Set up, yeah, and training. Sorry? Set up cost. But yes. the actual contract would be right around 13,900. Of course, that varies with employees it varies based on how many people you know you submit payroll for this is just their best guess so this is based upon a, a guess that um i'm assuming you gave them the, the number of employees so they could come up with this proposal yes and so whatever the number was i assume is close to what you expect yes it's, it looks like it's 80. okay well and, and it's a little bit complicated because there's 
employees that get paid monthly. There's employees that only, that only get paid when they have a BCA yeah. meeting. There's So it is somewhat complicated to figure that out. Like select work gets paid monthly, so does the fire. And so it, it's different rates for different, you know, things. But I made sure that both companies that we were talking to had the exact same information. <clears throat> Okay, so not to get into the weeds, but um, when, when I look at this summary, which is a, an estimate, and I see on the first line, Paychex Flex Enterprise Package, 50 units, and the total is $158.34. The next line, Paychex Flex Time, 80 units, $77.52. So are the units uh, the number of employees? And how do they arrive um, at the totals? And if you look at the totals, for the first section is 262, the next section is 59, then 528, $25. And that seems to me it should total the 13,900, but it doesn't. So is there something that I'm not seeing? Because it's monthly and bi-weekly. One so pay period, yes. For the whole year. Right, the first first block is pay per period bi-weekly. Now, bi-weekly can mean once a, uh, every two weeks or it can mean twice a week. Which way does it mean here? Two weeks. Every two every weeks. weeks. Every two weeks. Every two weeks. So yeah. that's good. Um, and then the next block is pay per period monthly. Now, even even when you, you apply the, at least when I tried to apply the, the monthly, uh, it didn't come out. So if you look at the second block here, $59. $59. So that's going to be like um, $709 six. for 12 months. Okay. That's so, what that, I just did. So, so that you've done the math. And if you if you add those up, it, it adds up to the 13000 I haven't done it. I just did the monthly, seeing what it, okay. $59.10 for 12 months comes up to, I'm assuming that's what they did. I, I, I suggest that somebody go through it and just make sure that uh, it in fact is 13.9. So I'm doing it real quick here for you. So if you do the first one, bi weekly would be you take the 262.36 times 26. Yeah, 26 bi weeklies. Right. That's $6,812. Call, okay. call it 7000 just to see how close Around we are. Here. The second one, 59.10 times 12, 708. So now we're up to like $7,500. Uh, the third one is a monthly fee, 528.72 times 12 is 6,336. We're getting there. You are just about, and then you throw in the annual and then the fee, $25, $25 yeah. the okay. implementation fee, that yeah, gets you right. I'm not adding these up, but we're, but really, we're really close. We are yeah. there. But it so is that a good explains question. And yeah, I will it is a good say, question. That explains it. I will it. say, when I first read through this, I read through this this afternoon, I was wondering, how, how, did, how did we get the 13? How did we get to the number? Yeah, But you were right in noticing the bi-weekly and annual. I didn't do the calculations today. But I, the explanation helps. Thanks. Tom Cody, I'm sorry. Uh, instead of reading off our iPhones like you asked to do, could uh, the other boards print out the agenda packet so that we can pick it up uh, when we come in at these meetings? And it would really be a big help for us to have that packet with us and instead of looking at, trying to figure stuff out and read it on your, on our iPhones. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, the, the planning and the DRB, they, they both have their packets. Uh, I'll print it out for us when we come in. It would be very helpful for us. Yeah, we can look into that. I'm just I, I'm I thinking think, about the cost. Yeah, I mean, last one was around 70 pages, so. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's why I didn't have it. Cause my We're going to kill, machine, kill some trees. Yeah. But I think it would be helpful for the people to have it. It's 70 pieces. You guys have 70 people on me tonight. Oh, <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> budget season. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we have a motion. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, okay. Judy Halberry, administrative assistant. Um, so last week's package was seven, our last meeting was about 70 pages. I don't know how many copies to make. One meeting we had 
five people here. Another meeting, we have 50 people here. Um, so I can make the copies. I don't mind at all, Tom. Yeah. I think what would be super helpful is if you would like a printed copy, could you email me and I'll have a copy for you? Because if I make 50 copies, the ink, we get charged per, per page by SimQuest for the printer. The ink, the paper, it all adds up, folks. It's going to go on to the budget for a line item. But so I don't mind doing that. But could you just request it? Is that reasonable? Well, I think you can That's do reasonable. something like just do 10 to run out of that. I mean, I'll talk to Todd because he knows how many he meant. I can't hear that. No, it's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm I think. Yeah, you can do that. So we have um, a motion on the floor, I believe. I've forgotten. Second. You second it? Okay, great. <coughs> Had a discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we've got approve the payroll software program. Number nine, approve the lease for the holder for the financing and purchase of the holder sidewalk machine. Is that Tina again? Did this me? So uh, we were discussing various Thank ways you. of uh, the sidewalk machine is in our current budget. So it's all been budgeted for, but we were discussing various ways that we could be creative to figure out what the best deal for the town would be. Chris came up with some really good thoughts on it. Um, Sarah worked really hard to get three bids from banks. Um, the first option is the lease and the lease itself, it's all the same dollar amount. There is no difference in dollar amount, it's difference in interest. So the lease is a 5.96% interest for five years. Union Bank is a 5.49% interest for five years. And if you wanted to borrow money from the buildings fund, because we're not using it right now, which is one of the ideas Chris suggested, you could borrow money from us. We could borrow our own money to use for this and pay it back as we would a bank at even a 1% interest or no interest. Um, so those are all options. I can tell you the dollar amount yearly is what you would pay. Um, the lease would be 37,356. The union bank would be 36,909. And if we self financed it, it would be 32,782 with 1% interest. So, you know, taking this in another step, um, I talked with Kevin and I'd like Kevin to kind of walk us through the machine, um, but, um, as we look to finance equipment, um, just in particular, I guess the first question that I ask is, what's the projected longevity of that piece of equipment? Yeah. So five years that we're potentially um, financing it for, is it 10 years down the road? Because I think that, you know, as all things flow down to the bottom line, if the expected life of this machine is say 10 years, why not pay for it over 10 years? And that reduces your annual you know, burden to the taxpayer. Um, and, um, and it saves the municipality um, uh, money in terms of long-term financing. Um, you know, the lease agreement at 5.96 and the other banks that we're talking about, it doesn't make any logistical sense to me. Uh, a, to finance it, not to like the expectancy of the machine, but also to pay that kind of interest rate, uh, particularly when we have ARPA funds that are currently sitting in our general um, general fund. Um, it would be, in my opinion, good use of that money uh, in the short term. Um, even if we paid a 1% uh, interest back to ourselves, it would allow some capital gain on that fund. Um, and then moving forward, I think that we'll have a separate uh, agenda item to talk a little bit about um, investing that ARPA money uh, in, in uh, fixed asset um, uh, CDs or something. Yeah, it's former ARPA money. It's now called the Buildings Facilities Fund. Right, but it was generated. It was generated initially through ARPA funds. And right now we have $397,000 available to be used. The rest of it has been invested. Right. Um, and 
they told me that the, the warranty on this machine is a five year warranty. Generally, we finance our vehicles for the lo longevity of the warranty. That way, if they start breaking down afterwards, we're not paying big repair bills, but I can let Kevin speak to that. Sure. Kevin Barrows, Highway Superintendent. So on the, I can go backwards, obviously not forward. I don't know what this machine is going to do, how it's going to hold up. The machine we previously have, we've had it for eight years. Um, last account, I think we were close to sixty thousand dollars in repairs in it in the last three or four years. So I mean, it's it's a fairly expensive machine, but it's also it's a niche machine, machine, right? It's it does sidewalks. That's what it does. So whenever you buy a machine that only has a certain function, they're usually more expensive to purchase and more expensive to maintain. So one of the questions I asked Kevin today was, uh, was there, is there other options for us to look at? Um, would we uh, be uh, just as well off to purchase, um, let's say a compact tractor with implements that would be similar to what this specific machine would would offer us. Um, it would have a bucket, a plow, sander, um, and potentially a brush, uh, so that if you had a, uh, a couple of inches of snow, you're not putting a blade on the sidewalk, you're brushing it. Um, and I, would you like to talk to us a little bit now so that everybody kind of understands the exercise you went through? Sure. We've over the last couple of years, knowing that this machine was going to have to be replaced, we've basically looked at every maker of sidewalk cleaning equipment um, around the world and have stayed away from anything foreign. It's too far away. We can't get pirates if it does break down. So trying to stay with things that are, I'll say locally, but at least in the U.S. How's that? Um, and basically, uh, looking at the Avants like uh, Jason has or Pete's equipment has over here, their equipment's too large. And so we've always gone back to the holder because of the size. And that's what it comes down to. The biggest thing for us is Elmore Street. You go up Elmore Street, the sidewalk, just before you get up into the, the sweeping corner, there's a cement wall and there's telephone poles. We've got to fit between them. And Holder right now is the only <coughs> company that offers us a machine that will fit between those that telephone poles and those that cement wall. We've looked at trackless, definitely a, a, a huge amount of different machines. And is that the only place that we we run into a? <coughs> no, we have about five places. We have to watch to the bridge down here on Lower Bridge, right, so our up on bridge. We have to be able to fit into that. I mean, so there's a few places that we have to watch our size to be able to fit through. I think too, in our conversation, Kevin, you had intimated that the machine that we currently have that's eight years old. It was a fairly new prototype of this particular model, and it was correct. tested at that at this at that point in which we purchased it. Is that correct? Correct. It was uh, the first first off of a machine. Um, I mean, I don't know about other people, but when I'm looking at new cars, I don't buy the first model year, right? I want somebody else to get the bugs worked out of it. Um, so we've worked the bugs out of this machine, and a lot of updates have been put into the new style machine the new it's no longer a 270 it's a 70 series and it has a lot more features and added benefits to it that came out of us having ours for the last eight years and and, and others and are you saying uh the benefit of leasing over buying is the repair cost well at this point to so show to me there is no benefit one way or the other Okay. it's the it's the warranty it's five years after the five years is up really the machine is at its point where it's going to start breaking down so it's at that point do you roll it over get another machine at five years so that you just you always have that warranty to stay with mm -hmm. it's the same thing we're trying to do with I our see. big trucks right mm -hmm. we're trying to stay at that six seven year cycle so that we're always under a warranty so that our repair costs should and would drop in the budget. And the, this current one is leased or paid? It's completely paid. Um, any resale value or? $12,000 is what they're going to give us. So I, I guess the other thing that really kind of sticks in my craw a little bit about it is the fact that 
for the lease of five years or however we pay for this, um, it's going to sit in the garage for six months out of the year. It's going to collect dust for six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. So really, you're leasing it for five years, but you're going to get two and a half years worth of use out of it. Mm -hmm. And it seems ridiculous to me, based on that, that you know the potential to spend sixty thousand dollars in repairs for a machine that effectively is only used for two and a half years and it costs one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. I I don't know. I just um, and this only plows, right? Well, there's lots of other attachments that'll go onto this machine. There's an over the rail mower. There's a front uh, flail mower. There's a sweeper that goes on it. We have the snowblower attachment that goes on it. It's sand. We have sands and salts. Sands and salt. Does it mulch leaves? No. Is there an attachment to do that? No, not that I'm aware of. Because those are really cool. But well, we, we're looking at our vacuum system coming in hopefully this week. Okay. So, and Kevin, those attachments are included in the 159. No, no. There's no attachments. We have the a dump body. A uh, straight plow and a salter spreader you know, on the back. So any that's of our attachments that. that we own, can they be used on this new one? Yes, we have a V plow that we cap and the snowblower. Okay. So Chris, I, I hear your concerns, but do. do I hear? But I don't hear any like options. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess I look to Kevin to make sure that mm -hmm. you look at you know uh, other options. I, you know, we're in a 13th hour here because the machine is effectively sitting in our garage right now. It was delivered today. And now we're, we're coming to a point of how we're going to pay for it. So I guess in the grander scheme of things, um, I don't want to pay 6% in interest on no. the lease agreement. No. I would prefer to borrow money from ourselves. Yes. Either at no interest or 1% interest. Um, if the board decides that they want to pay for this over a five-year period, because that's the length of the warranty, um, so be it. Um, but I just, you know, for something that's going to get used for two and a half years out yeah. of five years, I just, I would like to see, I'd like to reduce that payment, at least by the interest payment, but I'd also like to pay for it over a longer period of time if we're legally allowed to do that, just because I it, I can't believe that we're going to wear this thing out in five years. I think that you might have ended up with a lemon on the first one, but I think that we might want to roll the dice here a little bit and uh, extend this because at the end of the day, it's all going to pull down to our bottom line. Yep. And that's what I want to look at. So if we, I don't know who would have the answer to this, but so if we decided to finance it ourselves and we said we, we wanted to warn, keep the lease for five years, but want, would we have the option to extend it later? The warranty? No, not the warranty, the uh, lease. Sorry. But would, would we, after five years, have the opportunity to buy it, let's say, when the lease is up? After well, that, you've owned it. The, the, they call it a lease, but at the end of five years, you own it. It's, 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 it's an owner finance. It's, it's, it's not a lease. The, okay. Oh, so we're going to own it after we're five gonna years. We're going to own it after five years. Oh. So we technically are buying it. So the reason I ask Correct. that is usually when you lease a car from a car or mm -hmm. a truck, they give you an idea, they give you a very good idea of what it's going to be worth at the end of the lease period. Do we have an idea of what this thing might be worth in five years? They added that into the finance paperwork that they sent you. They didn't send me anything about what no. they thought it would be worth at the end of the lease period, no. Okay. Well, we know that this one's worth 12000 so. Right. It's I a mean, misnomer to call this a lease. Yeah. It's not, not a lease, yeah. You're right. leasing it. You are. You're purchasing, purchasing it okay. through a finance company. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering. Which is what we do with numerous pieces of equipment. Right. Yeah. Police cars. It's it's a lease, but we own it after the four year lease. Right. So we can, after five years, decide whether we're going to sell it and or trade it in and get a new one after five years. After five years, the warranty's up. So yes, yeah. I think what you're saying is then yeah. we're liable for the repairs. Right. Did you want to speak? So certain? the proposals we have in front of us right now are to. We have we have three proposals in front of us, and these all include buying. You have five options. Five, five options. One is to or finance it. One is to go to the finance company that has the machine. Right. And these are the bank options. Okay, so these these three that I'm looking at right now are to buy the machine and to finance it through these three banks over five years. The fourth option is to finance it through the dealer. That's what we're referring to as the lease, whether it's a lease or not. 
And then the fifth option is what you're presenting, Chris, is to use our finance. money, yeah. our bridge fund, uh, which is now called, and buy this ourselves, lend the money to ourselves, and, uh, and make a little bit of money off of that. I guess, so those are the five options. Like, so the money that's in the bridge fund, Tina, that's not it's not allocated to anything or the it's, infrastructure it's the funds. buildings and um the, uh, the build municipal buildings infrastructure fund infrastructure fund. I'm sorry. um it is it's gaining interest where it is but we are not using any of the money until you guys decide what you want to do in terms of municipal buildings or whatever it's going to sit there until some decisions are made i will tell you that if you um the lease, will, you'll end up paying $27,000 in interest with the Union Bank, which is the lowest bank. You're going to pay twenty five. dollars This is over five years. And if we um, do it ourselves for 1% self-financing, we're going to pay $4,400. Per year? No, that's for five oh, years, right. through, through the whole five years. Right. But we're paying it to ourselves, so. That's right. Yeah. right. Basically, the 1% is just a... Uh, a gratuity of capital gain. Yeah. Yes. Return on uh, mm -hmm. myself or mm -hmm. on How do we pay that? How do we pay? What? Where do we get? Where do we get the money to pay for that? Taxpayer. It, well, <laughs> it's, it, well, what would happen is, is that we would basically act as our own bank, and we would pay for the machine out of the buildings fund. If that's what you chose to do, and then twice a year we would put money back into the buildings fund as as the payment is due so to speak so it's almost like writing ourselves an invoice twice a year to put the money back so we'd write, we'd write the company a check for the total the total amount yes we today, would have tomorrow, to do that and then do that okay which would be like uh, fifty nine thousand. yes four hundred ninety one thousand. so chris had mentioned i'm um, doing it over like 10 years or a longer period of time. I don't know about banking ourselves and borrowing rules about that, but I do know that if you were gonna um, go with one of like the bids from the bank, you can't um, take a loan for something out for more than five years without voter with like a separate article. So that's, that's not an option. You can only do the five years because there wasn't a separate um, article okay. on that. So I think what you, I think, what there are five options um i would recommend i would say there's only three because with the bank options i would just recommend the lowest bid so i think it's you're choosing between the union bit bank at the five point four nine. nine you're choosing between the financing from the company yeah. that makes the machine or us financing it ourselves which i think you need to determine do you have any projects that you're coming up in the next five years that you're going to need that cash for or not and that's what that's what you have to decide are you doing something with um the village garage and moving moving stuff that, for? so that's that's really what the decisions and we know that this is legal for us to do to borrow from money from ourselves and pay off I've never done this. I don't know. <laughs> in, essence, in essence, we kind of do that anyway with like the Katie's Falls Special Tax District. I mean, we, we took a loan out for it. We charge our people for it. We did it with the TIF District. I mean, there's nothing I don't think legally that says you can't bar use your savings account to pay for something and then pay your savings account back. I don't, there's nothing okay. illegal about that. Right. It's just an accounting. That's right. It's just, it's yeah. Money. All right. All right. So then, I guess the only thing that concerns me is we've got three hundred fifty thousand dollars in this bridge, or not bridge. I keep saying that the building and infra infrastructure fund. So we're talking about taking one hundred fifty thousand out of it. You have eight hundred fifty thousand dollars of compromise. Yeah, but some of that is invested. Yeah, just, some of yeah. But this is this right. is the money that we have. This is have. this is the only liquid money. This is so, the liquid. So, so we're just talking about one hundred fifty thousand for one machine. Yeah. We're going to take yeah. out of there just. So my question is, the rest of the money, how is it invested and how liquid is it? Yes. 
Do you know? know? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a Sarah question. I don't, I didn't know that you, I don't have the information in front of me. It's all invested in Edward Jones. Some of it at longer, you know, it's in CD. Some of them are in stocks and it's, some of them are longer. I don't have the portfolio right here with me. I like the idea. I think it's very creative. I'm just wondering if we are, are we ready to make this decision? I, I, it seems like there's a few unanswered questions. I, I like what you said, Sarah. I think there really is three decisions now. The Union Bank, the lease agreement, whatever you want to call it, with the company, the manufacturer, and um, you know, borrowing money from ourselves. We do have the machine sitting in our garage. So but the, question, the question, I guess, to Kevin is, is that based on and Kevin and Tina, yeah. I guess, is, is that how quickly is this company looking for a contract or a payment? Yes, right. Can we wait two weeks and get some information? They were calling us at 4.30 on Friday to get this information. The guy sent me 40 emails and now his machine's sitting in our shop. He wants his money. Yeah. I mean, it's not, <laughs> he, he's not gonna wait two weeks. <laughs> no, he's gonna come get his machine. Yeah, I, I was unaware and I think Kevin was too that they were gonna be delivering it like that. We told them they had to wait 30 days until after because it was in the budget and they waited 30 days and then dropped it off. So well, Kevin, when, when do you anticipate us needing this oh. machine? <laughs> I know that's a right. That's a. <laughs> so Roger Hill says the twenty fifth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I realized when that came out, I was like, yeah, so really. So if, if we want to wait to make a decision, we could go with the Union Bank, and then we could decide to pay off that loan with the money that's in the account. Well, or we could spend That's the money, option. get an accounting of, um, use the building fund right now, find out so that we have for future, know what these investments are, and find out what our liquidity is for emergency so we can make some longer term plans. And if it looks like, um, you know, that we're strapping ourselves, we could always then go get uh, a bank loan. <laughs> no. It's, I know, it's a little iffy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Tony, Cody, uh, Cody Hill. I think we had to do what Chris did, uh, said on the onset here is check with Jason over there at the uh, at the uh, whatever is Pete's Pete's equipment sir uh, tell this guy to come and get his machine because I think that's what should happen that, that, that shouldn't happen and I think Jason I think Jason can find us a machine that would do our sidewalks and probably for half the cost just saying Uh, you want to Paris Morrisville? Uh, I think myself personally, uh, we should take the money out of that three hundred fifty thousand dollar deal, pay ourselves back. It's, it's kind of crazy to pay for interest or twenty four thousand, twenty five thousand dollars worth of interest when we've got the money. To, and I'm sure that money that's in some account is not earning the interest that you're going to pay to get the piece of equipment. Number two, this equipment, considering it only works pretty much all winter which is not every day. It doesn't snow in Vermont every day where we're out there doing this, that it should run the five years with proper maintenance and not having cowboys running it as a piece of equipment. And then we should be able to get another three or four years without, without paying anything for the piece of equipment. It does take maintenance and it does take somebody being careful with it. And I know sidewalks can be kind of a, crap shoot especially because some of our sidewalks aren't all that nice you know but I, I think if we need a new machine we should just use our money and and save save the interest from the bank yeah, yeah and i and i think that you know uh, borrowing money from ourselves makes the best logical um, choice um, and I also think that we need to sit down as a board and take a look at the balance of money that's invested with Edward Jones because anybody that follows the stock market 
understands that it has not been all that predictable by the hour, much less by the day, and um, how we want to protect the best value for right. that fund moving forward, because we will have a purpose for that. We have a highway garage that we need to deal with. We've got other things that we need to deal with, and we want to maximize how that's invested. But that's a separate conversation, but for tonight, I would really prefer to pay cash for this machine and um, and then work out the logistics of the balance of that money um, with Sarah and Tina and the board. Well, I would agree. And, you know, I, I said a while ago, it seemed like a no brainer, you know, rather than paying all this interest to somebody else, making a little bit of yeah. money for ourselves. I'm just, the only last question I have is should we be doing this? Should we finance this ourselves over five years versus 10 years? Why not pay it off quickly in five years? Right. Get I, it done. The I, warranty is five years. I wouldn't argue with that. I would agree with that too. Okay. Uh, Tom Cooley, I, I'm glad you're doing all this really heavy uh, thinking and forward down how much this kind of stuff going to cost. My problem is working with this company that dumps the machine down and says, "Pay us so I could tonight," and 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 tell Dino to get you know get to work, and we want this money. I mean, why are we dealing with this company? We got uh, you know the Leo's right down the corner. We can pay him off doing the same thing, and I bet he can come. And say, Maybe it won't fit between the telephone pole and the and the thing, so the guy gets out and shovels that. But I bet we get a better deal, and at least somebody we know, and he's not going to dump the machine off and say, "Yeah, pay for it." So that, it's just my problem the way they're going about treating the town. Kevin, what I what think, is the piece of equipment, and who is the company? <laughs> Do we have that information? Yes, so the machine is built by Holder, and Holder. the company is Chadwick Bayross. Um, and they're the only ones? Chadwick Bayross. Um, they're the only ones, and they're the only dealer in this area. Stowe uses them, Essex uses them, a lot of towns use Holder. Okay, the Holder, yeah, I see. Yeah, Waterbury. Waterbury yeah. uses them. Okay, and where are they actually located? Uh, New Hampshire. Okay. So it's not a, but they're the only ones that have the holder. Correct. Yes. And I have to assume that they, there was an understanding on their part to send it. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't. Well, I, th I think it's important to mention that this was think. researched. All the homework was done last budget season. Right. And we're just ordering it out because of the delay in the budget. So yeah. we've been working with this company since, you know, the end of November of last year. Uh, so this isn't something that we just started doing recently. Yeah. You know, Kevin's done his due diligence. He, you know, he's looked at other machines, but he's expressed his, opinion on how we can't fit other machines in certain spots in our town so this is something that's been going on for almost 12 months now yeah. and i you know quite frankly when i had this conversation with kevin today you know um, i wasn't involved in all those conversations so when it came up on our packet in terms of the financing deal it just raised some red flags for me so i in the last you know, 12 hours it's sort of been catching up on yeah on the whole process here so i didn't need to throw too much of a harness nest in here but it's still 160 thousand dollars and i do suspect that this piece of equipment's been sitting on their lot so there's you know they need to oh i'm sure that's 159 thousand yeah. in their yeah, pocket so so i'm sure there is a little bit of uh, thank you kevin thanks Great. So okay tina tina piece i'm piecing together a potential motion here I assume the motion needs to say that we would be using the building infrastructure fund to purchase this 2023 piece of equipment, and um, that we would finance it over five years. Yes, and you want to specify an interest rate if you want to charge us an interest rate. And a one percent interest. Rate. Whatever you decide. So yeah. what depart? So who's borrowing from the buildings? Is it the town of Morris? The town of Morris Town's borrowing taking money from their buildings and infrastructure fund to purchase this piece of equipment right, to be paid back over mm -hmm. five, five years. years at a one percent interest rate does that help john yes okay I'm that. jamie jarrett uh my question to the board is do you really think it's worth spending thirty thousand dollars a year for five years to clear some sidewalks we legally have to 
keep sidewalks. Clean. We could also go outside the box and start sending out bids. And I'll bet you if you send out bids, it'll come in a lot cheaper. And you don't have to worry about owning a piece of equipment mm -hmm. and maintaining it. Like you said, That's it's only going to be running for five months out of the year at best. And how many times in that five months is it going to run? Five to six times a month for five months. It's a lot of money to spend for mm -hmm. a piece of equipment that's not going to be utilized properly. Well, and the, and the goal there too is, is that that even though we're paying for it over five years, I guess it's my goal to see that machine last for ten years. So that you're paying for it in five, but you're getting the benefit of that machine over a ten year period. And I could I would be I would put money on it that if you amortize that over 10 years, you'd be hard pressed to get somebody to outbid that payment price over 10 years if you amortize it over that life of that machine um, to do all the sidewalks in, in the town and village. Now, that's assuming that you don't have any maintenance dollars put into it. I, I agree. As Kevin said before, eight years old, he's put in over $50,000 into it. Right. So now let's put that into the equation too. Right. Now you're over two hundred thousand dollars for something that that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I mean, put yourself in a position. Would you go out and buy something for two hundred thousand dollars for your house that maybe is more of a luxury than it is a necessity? Well, I so. think part of it is we also have contracted employees that if they aren't doing the work, what are they doing? You know, is that? I think also I we have to look at. There's a safety issue here that the sidewalks have to be kept in a certain uh, condition for liability. No, I, I, I get that. That that's and, not. That's, and I'm also concerned that's about. Right. But is it is it a thirty thousand dollar a year investment yeah, to make it? It's thirty thousand plus, right? It's probably thirty three, thirty four thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of money. You really think about it for the amount of sidewalks that it's going to do. I mean, if we look at last year and front porch forum, how many people kept coming back and saying, why aren't they doing our sidewalks? And meanwhile, people are doing them by themselves. Where I used to live, people used to do their sidewalks in front of their homes. Not the towns, the towns would take care of roads. And at the same time, we also, a bit out and we had contractors coming in to do side roads for the town while the town did the main roads so there was a lot of savings there they didn't have to hire more people you know what the the hiring process is mm -hmm. and how hard it is to get people to work you're better off looking outside the box and trying to start thinking about bidding out things you're right why not Ellen. Evelyn Morrisville, uh, Evelyn Throne. Um, yeah, I think that there is some um, question. I'm, I was never used to having sidewalks being done, you know, uh, but I didn't live in a town where I lived before. Um, the thought of how often are they used can cut both ways. If the machine is used less, it obviously could last longer. So that part is good. If you're talking 10 years, that takes it down to $20,000 a year. There's also the idea of um, about 20,000. And if also, if it is a, this one was a prototype, maybe it had more issues, maybe it didn't, who knows. But um, the one question that I had was, if we bought it outright, I think it was answered before, but the the uh, warranty would still be that five years. Is there any way of getting an extended warranty? Is that worth it? No, Is that something you've looked at? They we never we offer check, it. We checked on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I just I think it's important to get the sidewalks done and to count on another comp. You know, another company coming in. I just can't see how that's going to work efficiently. I I could be wrong, but well, yeah. I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, the sidewalks are technically on town land. 
Yeah. We own the sidewalks. Right. right. So th therefore, the town is legally liable. So if someone slips and falls on that sidewalk, we're legally liable. So that that has something, the importance of keeping the roads clear. Yeah. Because um, I've lived in places where, you know, you have businesses, but it gets into, I'm pretty sure it's, that's what's starting to get into it is the legal liability that, you know, it's our legal obligation. I, I, if I can but, just comment, follow up on yeah. what Laura is saying, I, I would agree. You know, it's October 14th today, I believe. We're halfway through October 16th. We're kind of 16th. We're <clears throat> surprising that the, we haven't already seen snow on the ground. Yeah. We're going to see snow on the ground pretty quickly. And the townspeople are expecting their sidewalks to be taken care of. Yeah, it's a little late. I appreciate what you're saying. It's a little late to expect the townspeople to go out and take care of all the sidewalks all over town. I, I doubt everyone's going to be terribly excited about that. So I think it is our responsibility to take care of the roads. And we did, we did budget for this machine. We've been talking about this machine since Kevin's original presentation back last January. So it's not a, not a new idea by any means. But having said that, we haven't fully obviously discussed how we're going to pay for it. Going out to bid at this point, October 16th, and trying to find uh, someone to take over mm -hmm. the responsibility of taking all of our sidewalks, I suppose there could, could be somebody out there. Um, it's not certain that there's somebody out there. With um, that piece of equipment. Yeah, with this kind of equipment that's going to take care of the miles and miles of road sidewalk that we have in this town. We, we're not talking about just a little bit of sidewalk. We're talking about a lot of sidewalk. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. It's been great comments, but we got to remember where we are at this time of the year and what our responsibility is to this town, to the people that, that frequent this town. We'll do, do two more. Tony and uh, yeah. Tony, Cody, Cody Hill. So my first question is, is the old machine completely dead? Uh, no. No. My second, my, my second uh, proposal is I'm in Stowe at 615 every morning, six days a week. I clean the Union Bank over there. I see Stowe in the village using a Kubota tractor with whatever attachments they need, and they do a very good job. And I know for a fact, a Kubota tractor is probably a third of that cost. And they get by just fine. So I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. For us to pay $200,000 for our sidewalk machine, I think it's a little bit much. Thank you. Mr. Throne? I don't think, uh, Jerry Throne, I don't think we're ever going to head in this direction. I just wanted to mention to you something uh, to follow up with what Evelyn said. And that is, uh, we're not used to having our sidewalks uh, clean for us. So other towns, other cities have the same liabilities, but they put the onus on the property owner to clear it. If you don't clear your sidewalk within so many hours after a storm, they can fine you. Maybe that's how they do it. I don't know. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I don't know if it's a Vermont a state law that the sidewalks be cleaned. I see them cleaned all over the state. So uh, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. Just mentioning it. I think we need to make a decision here tonight. You all know you, you do. Uh, we don't have time to uh, get bids. It could snow next week. So I, I think you'll make the best decision. Thank you. Just one other question, just for clarity's sake. When uh, when this machine was ordered during the budget process, I'm assuming that some sort of contract was signed with them. Is that right, for them, or Kevin? No. No. Okay. So there was there was no there was a gentleman's agreement in terms of the fact that they would you know provide this. Well, it wasn't ordered until just recently. Right. You know, we waited. We told them we needed to wait the 30 days right. after the budget passed. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you've been in conversation with them for some period of time. Correct. Right? Since last fall, last about this time last year. And is the old one? Uh, you said it's got a twelve thousand dollar value. Is it technically sold? Is that a guarantee we're going to get that money? Yes. So that's already been deducted. That's already darn. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was hoping we 
<laughs> found some money. All if right. we'd have done this last year, it was they were going to give me twenty thousand for it. Mm. Yeah, well, all right. Mm. Kevin, is it sold or still ours? Uh, well, we haven't finalized any paperwork, so technically it's still ours. And the one that's sitting in my shop is theirs until we finalize the paperwork. But then it, you've got to add 12000 onto this if you don't sell it. Okay, I'm ready to call the question. Call the vote. We don't have a motion yet. Well, I'm just oh, curious. Motion then. Any chance that our machine would make it another year? Not without putting a lot of money into it. <coughs> would need a massive amount I only amount was going to take the two people I called. Thanks. Oh, God. You ready? Yeah, I'm going to butcher this, I know, but I'll make an attempt at it. This is ugly. So I'm going to move to. No. Use our use Morristown's the town of Morristown's building and infrastructure fund to purchase the 2023 Holder C270 sidewalk tractor. At for one hundred and fifty nine thousand four hundred ninety one dollars, and finance that purchase ourselves at a rate of one percent over five years, and no, that's it. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> that's what I was just saying. Okay. Do we need to authorize Jason to sign on this? I believe so. You guys on the motion? It was on the motion. It was on the motion, yes. That was only if you were going to sign the lease. Okay. okay. That's why I hesitated. All right. Okay. So we don't so we'll All right. I have a motion. I have a second. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> Any discussion from the board? Um, I have a lot of mixed reservations about this, but I'm new in this conversation. You know, this has been budgeted, it's been passed by the voters. Um, they, uh, they think it's the best of a not great situation that we are uh, financing yourself. So we're going to pay 6% on it. Um, so I guess I said all, all that I need to say at this point. Okay. I'll say I concur with Chris's statement there. I'm I'm new to this and it is in the budget, but it does seem like a pretty healthy expense for a sidewalk machine. But I think we're in the eleventh hour and we need to yeah. make a choice. Did you want to say something, Jason? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the motion is passed. Yeah, look at some options. Okay, number ten. Approve ordering two tandem trucks and one single axle truck from Allegiance to Highway Department. So I can speak to this and if there's any follow up. So we've been starting our budget process for 24, 25. And this past, the budget that we're in right now, we eliminated the highway trucks. So the build time right now on highway trucks is around 13 months. So all three manufacturer charlie boys and alliance or allegiance sorry uh both told us if we order the trucks now we can cancel the order if the budget fails so there's no clause that once you say yes tonight we we need to keep them um, we ordered a truck that they can easily sell to another municipality or a private company uh, there's nothing special on it it's your normal uh dump truck with a plow so they uh so that's the big clause here. You know, we are asking permission from the select board to place this order because then we'll have them in time for December of 2024. But again, if the budget fails or if these get chopped, um, there's no penalty to us. We made the salesman made it very clear to us. So, but to get the ball rolling, we are asking the select board to give us permission to place the order on these three trucks. There's no down payment. There's no down payment. There's no discussion on financing yet. This is simply saying we would like to buy these three trucks, but again, they're spec trucks. We could, if something goes bad in March or before then, 
we can eliminate one or two or all three. So this is really just a matter of getting our name on the list and getting our name towards the top 13 months from now. Yep, and this, uh, from what they're telling us, this is common practice with other municipalities. This is the way cars and trucks are sold these days. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have time to talk about the option of whether it's more fruitful for us to either lease it or purchase it, and whether we finance it for seven years, which is the extended warranty versus five years, we still. Yeah, I mean, all those meat and potatoes types of things you'll hear when Kevin does it, but his uh, budget presentation in the end of November, beginning of December. Um, we're working out all those details right now, so. Yeah, I, I don't see any harm in order because there's a, mm. no harm, no foul piece. Mm. But if we don't do it, we're not going to see it for over a year anyway. Yeah, and we do have three trucks that are need to be two out of three are in really bad shape and are costing us a lot of money. So well, we we don't want to get behind the eight ball too much here. Look at the cost difference in these trucks um, based on 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. We had that in our budget comparison. Mm -hmm. so, a lot of money. So, yeah. Is there, uh, if you order on are these, these uh, perspective costs, are they sort of lock and loaded or is, are they going to be variable as well? Well, you know, we didn't get a solid answer on that. You know, there could be a price increase from international potentially, but they gave us those numbers as of right now. So. The, so the single axle international is $224,503. And then the tandem international again is $275,294. So we have dual seamless. And that's the uh, plow, dump body, that's no. everything. Did, did Charlie Boyce was no better? No, there. So Charlie Boyce on, uh, for example, the Western Star was 290. Uh, the Freightliner was $300 less, but the uh, we're looking to get the Cummins engine, which the Freightliner doesn't have. So felt that extra 300 bucks was worth it because of the engine. So we're not we're not making a decision on what where you're ordering it, just that you're going to go ahead and order. There's well, we're gonna let's see. Do we have the motion? Yeah, the chat. So we are going to go with um, Allegiance. We okay. are recommending to the select board that we would be purchasing those three trucks from Allegiance. All right. Okay. I don't think we have. Do we have that? I don't think we have that in writing. No. no, no. So you'll have to. Sorry. So we have to make it up. And I. There's a tandem truck and a single axle truck. You're saying three trucks? Are we yep. getting two of something? Two tandem, one two single those. axle from Allegiance. Okay, thank you. So who would like to do a motion on that? I'll make a motion to go ahead and through uh, Jason, our interim administrator, to go ahead and order two tandem trucks and one single axle truck from Allegiance. Uh, oh, here it is, sorry. No. Okay. okay. Understanding that there is no obligation on our part at this point, we just need to get in the field. I'll second that. I had a motion and a second. Any discussion? Tom? Yeah. It's like somebody's got their hand yeah. up there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to come up every time there's a budget item. Say and your I, name first. Tom Cludia. Here we go. We, you just you took in hundred and some thousand dollars out of a, the building fund. You, you're asking this is what over five hundred thousand dollars for trucks. Six, Usually you six hundred thousand. Six seventy. Yeah. Oh, six hundred and seventy thousand. Thank you. And uh, we we haven't even got to the budget yet, and you're already spending this money. I, and uh, well, you just order them. And why does this? Why does this town have to have three trucks ordered the same year? Why can't this be spread out and help out the local, the the taxpayer? I know you're not putting any money down on that, but, but I mean, I think that's the discussion we're going to have at, well, going I'm into just, the budget. Uh, Yes, we are. And I'm just yeah, preparing so, you that we are going to have this discussion. Well, I, I think that we, we honestly expect 
to have a discussion about this. But yeah. part of the issue here, Tom, is, is that these trucks should have been should have been ordered sort of in succession over the last several years yeah. to 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 do just what you're saying is to spread out those payments so, okay. instead of ordering all in the same year. But because of the budget constraints that we've had and the budget battles that we've had, this the, it's come home to roost where we've got we spent a boatload of money. And Kevin can tell you exactly how much and Tina can tell you exactly how much on the trucks of trying to keep these on the road. The fact that they're well, we got, we'll, we'll, we'll argue about whether okay. whether you're going to have the taxpayers pay for these three trucks now because somebody back there didn't do it year by year by year. That'd be later for our discussion. Right yes. now, like that's good. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm not looking forward to it. I am. We're going to have Tommy on Zoom. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, my question was along the same lines as Tom's. Um, why are we doing three truck sets at the same time? And why can't we, you know, along with the sidewalk equipment, that is a lot of money. Why aren't we spacing that out? We didn't catch the name on that one. Nancy uh, Dunavan. The na Could you introduce yourself, please? Nancy Dunavan. So, excuse me, Kevin, I know that this is in the past, there's been, um, a plan in place about replacing equipment as we go on. Can you speak to the question that's been raised today? Sure. Thank you. Kevin Barrows, Highway Superintendent. So over the last three years, four years, we've kicked uh, two of these trucks down the road twice. Um, the third truck would be the one that we should be in this budget in that cycle of this plan. As, and as far as the sidewalk machine, it's it's longevity of the machine, and it's already been in it's in this year's budget, it's in this fiscal year's budget. So it's it's been passed and approved by the voters to be uh, appropriated and bought purchased. So as, all I can really speak to is the trucks moving forward is trying to get on that cycle again, that where we're not spending a whole lot of money to keep them on a road. So two of these trucks that are slated to go right now are both down in my shop being worked on because of lines rusted away, hoses that are break, breaking, um, antifreeze is going all over the place on one of them. We're repairing these trucks to keep them in service for another winter. And they usually, you know, winter is our hard time for, for trucks. Everything breaks more frequently in the winter time. So you, this has been on a schedule. These trucks would have been replaced before, but they were taken out of the budget because of costs. Correct, because of budget constraints. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yes. That's basically what you were saying. Yeah. So. Good. Jan Paris, Morrisville. It seems like we've done that with the highways as well. I mean, we keep kicking the roads down, down the proverbial highway. And so, I mean, we're, we're looking to spend an, I was in an arrow, $770,000 is the cash outlay we're looking at, but what about the highways? And we're going to have trucks to drive over potholes is what we have. So I, I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and we won't, I mean, this won't, this will go over several years. We're not going to pay out seven until, no, anticipated I mean, 770,000 next year or so we're, we're exploring the opportunities but i'm not i mean this is something that we can have the discussion yeah. in december but we're looking at seven years of financing and that will cover the warranty for the entire truck in seven years so but there's a lot of other discussions behind the scenes on this budget that's not really meant for tonight yep thank you okay so we have a motion and a second i believe did you second i, I will second okay I guess I just want to say, you know, this is, uh, I'm reiterating what's already been said, but we have to catch up to this can and, you know, it's down there somewhere and sometime because if we don't do anything now, we're going to be doing, we're going to be in the same boat next year and the same boat next year. In fact, we're going to be in a worse boat next year, um, but that's neither here nor there for tonight. That's part of the discussion that's going to start next month and 
in, well, December, January. So we just need to keep that in mind. Okay. So I'd like to, um, we, have, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving on to number 11, motion passed for the tandem trucks and one single axle truck. Approved public records inspection, copying, and transmission policy. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were speaking to it. <laughs> Please. Sarah Haskins, town clerk. So this is another policy like the policy you approved earlier this evening. Um, it's um, this is VLCT's sample policy with very, very minimal changes. It's all um, about um, public record requests and how it's just setting um, clear guidelines and expectations for the people that are submitting public record requests and for the um, employees and staff that are answering the public uh, record requests. On, um, how will we do them? Um, you know, how we'll charge for them? It, basically, that we will um, use the state statute of, of whatever the fees that the state sets at the time, and the guidance and the timelines that the state um, state sets. It's nothing different, really, than we're doing right now. There is an application. Um, Judy probably could speak a little bit more than that. Um, that's not required. <laughs> Um, unless it's a more complicated public uh, record request that we need um, some more guidance or information maybe to narrow down the scope of what that person's requesting. The, um, the, I know that in here, something I don't think we have been doing, it says that the um, uh, staff time can be um, compensated if the time exceeds 30 minutes. So at the cost determined by select board. So that's something we have to do at another time, right? Well, based, um, you're not, what you would set is that the uniform charge schedule. So you can only charge what the is in state statute. So it's not really that you can set the rate. You just oh, okay. say that you're going to take, um, well, set the state statutes. Say that we're gonna, we want to charge it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, both of those, A and B under, uh, number one under charges. Right. Yeah. And with Judy, do we need to do a formal motion that we want to do that? Yeah. I have, I have a yes. So, yeah. To, yeah. Do, mm -hmm. to do what? We just have to say that we've got to do it. It was created by VLCT. This is their standard bearer for public records requests. Is that correct? I just had a question, Judy, on the um, request form, and I think it's probably self-explanatory. If the um, third paragraph, if the law does not allow me to have access to some of these records, please inform me within three business days. But sometimes the, the town lawyer has to look at the, let's say, emails. And so you would let them, let the person know this is going to take longer than three days because of that. No, what that is, is there's exceptions to public records requests that we already know. So we have to let them know within three days. So we know what those exceptions okay. are. Um, the, you can extend the time frame out to 10 days and sometimes beyond if there's extenuating circumstances, like it's in storage and we have to go find them. Or it's, an, it's an, a lot of information. It's going to take us more time. Um, and then there's times where, especially more, more recently, where we're sending this information to the attorney right. to review, and we can't control how long that takes. We, we're, we're up against a state statute to do it in so many days, up to 10 days, uh, and we just do the best we can to get it done within 10 days. I mean, there's very few of us here, so, so that's what that is. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion? Um, I would make a motion to uh, accept the public record request policy for the time of our staff. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion has passed. We've accepted the public records inspection, copying, and transmission policy. Number Thank 12. Again, sir. 
Thank you. <laughs> Apply and submit municipal energy resilience program funding opportunity. So this is a municipal energy grant that uh, LCPC across the street, we've been working with them on the grant. Um, recently, we've uh, hired a project manager who is uh, running through and doing some of the projects that neither Jason nor I have time to do, uh, maybe sometimes not qualified to do, um, and to keep the town and afford momentum until we get a town manager in place. And um, so uh, her name is Carrie Johnson. She was approved two weeks ago. Uh, Carrie actually has this grant right now. She's looking at the um, or this this application and Carrie's looking at the salient points to it to see whether or not it benefits the town to do this. What what does it give us all of that stuff because this is due by October 31st. This is the only meeting we have before it's due that we're going to just approve the um, the fact that we can actually submit this and have either Jason or myself be the folks that submit this on behalf of the town. So we need a motion from the board tonight. Um, if we do go forward with it, that you've given us permission to uh, move forward and submit it. Do we have to give you permission to sign? Yes, okay. submit and sign, I'm sure. All right. Yep. Yep, standard for any grant. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any kind of idea of the time since we're paying Carrie per hour? What it's going to. Oh, I don't think it's much. Okay. Yeah, I don't think just... it's much. Uh, we just don't have, neither Jason nor I have time to sure. go to follow through. So she's working with LCPC to find out exactly what this is going to benefit the town okay. i don't think that requires a lot laura to okay. be honest i, did, I was but, just like if it's but, a 40 hour week or something but you know? i don't yeah. know either so okay. but i i don't think it's i don't think it requires that think, much yeah it's not well, a real um, what we know is, is that you don't have you don't have it in the end that you'll get this done you can't based yeah. on the time so it's due it's Okay. At the end of the month, right. so if we have any hope of receiving any mm -hmm. benefit from this uh, program funding, uh, we either need to outsource it or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can say that the original deadline on this was January, yeah. and it got oh. pushed to October thirty first. Oh. About three, maybe four weeks ago, I got notified it was due sooner. So yeah, so it really put us in a crunch of having, and I just don't have the bandwidth to do all this. Thank you. So I found a description if anybody wants to hear it. Anybody care? Okay. Uh, Municipal Energy Resilience Program provides staff support, application, and technical assistance for uh, and funding to increase energy resilience, uh, reduce energy use, and operating cost, and curb greenhouse gas emissions by promoting weatherization, thermal improvements, fuel switching, renewable energy, battery storage, electrical vehicle called charging, and enhanced comfort in municipal buildings. Is that good enough? Just to give. Thank you. Someone like what? to put a motion together. Yeah, I've got one here. Okay. So I'll make a motion to provide permission to submit <laughs> the Municipal Energy Resilience Program funding opportunity and for Jason Luno to sign. I would that. Okay, a motion is second. Any discussion? Um, yeah, I'm, I, I know about as much as you do from just Evelyn Throne, Marsville, uh, just from reading that little bit. But that's really been on my mind is the idea of, uh, especially if we can get funding for it, we can get expertise for it. That's one big way all companies across the country are finding that they can save money. Every dollar that they put into it, they get back money. They get back that back in a matter of a couple years, a lot of times. And if we can get some money actually from the state, well, then that's a no brainer because then we're getting the money back, but they've given it to us. So um, I would encourage you to do anything you can to get any of that moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Motion is passed. Moving into old, any old business? None. All right. Approve yeah. warrants. Yeah, we'll have to. Whoever sort of waiting on 
Um, so you, you've got two things the board has to sign. One is the errors and omissions, and the other is the public records request form. Do we want to work on that as we're looking at warrants? Are you talking to Judy? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think so. Judy. Sorry, Judy. not Judy. Yeah, Judy. Sorry. Judy. 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 Yeah. The other Judy. Judy too. There's a lot of stuff in here actually. We can come back to approving a warrants. Any department head reports? Hi, good evening again, Bill Mayor, CMS Chief. Three things. Uh, first two are positives, and the third one, I hope I still have a job when I'm done. First of all, um, uh, our service license has been uh, approved by the state of uh, by state health department, so we are uh, set for another two years as a critical care paramedic license service. Um, second of all, we have over the last ten days seen a uh, just a dramatic increase in acutely ill patients. Every day, we're seeing people who are critically ill, uh, and we've been relying on our police partners and our fire service friends uh, who have been consistent in backing us up and bringing us more manpower so our crews can be dedicated to taking care of those people. Uh, so uh, wow. uh, the system continues to work the way the system is designed uh, and we're providing really good care uh, to the people in our charge. Do you know what the cause of that is? <sighs> It's some some of it is COVID related. We're seeing spikes in COVID uh, throughout the state, just not in Lamoille County. Um, we're just seeing it's just one of those cyclical kind of things where we're seeing acutely ill people every day, uh, several almost several a shift. Um, accidents or anything? No, no, it's all been medical. It's all been medical stuff. Oh. So we're just seeing this spike uh, that. Uh, uh, like I said, without our fire service friends and our police colleagues backing us up, uh, uh, we'd, uh, uh, we'd really be in a mess here for trying to deliver the, the level of care that we expect to deliver and frankly, the, the people expect from us. Okay. The third item, uh, I'm sitting back there. Uh, I, I am, as a department head, I am completely in favor of the town do, doing whatever we need to do financially that makes sense for the town and release, relieves burden on the taxpayers. But if I understand correctly, we are using the building fund money to self-finance the lease on the sidewalk machine. That's correct. Okay. Let's talk about that building fund money that originally came to the town of Morristown as American Rescue Plan Act money. That was ARPA money. The ARPA guidelines as set out by VLCT when that money was released to towns throughout the state of Vermont talked about premium pay for essential workers and first responders. It talked about uh, public health infrastructure. Uh, it was basically set up to, uh, to reimburse towns or to let towns uh, go forward um, uh, during the pandemic crisis. Uh, our agency, uh, for lack of a better term, became the tip of the spear uh, in regards to public health response, delivering vaccinations, just not here, but throughout Lamoille County uh, in, in partnership with our Waterbury Ambulance colleagues. Um, so when that money became available to the town, uh, I, the chair and I met, she was our EMS liaison at the time, and I had a list of things that I thought that money could be used for, for the betterment of EMS. Some of the things on that list were uh, uh, increasing the wages from my staff. Uh, and I proposed doing that over two years and funding it in the budget starting in year three. Uh, I proposed new portable radios. These radios that we're using were purchased in 2009. I can't even get batteries for them anymore. Um, we've applied for two grants in conjunction with our police friends. Both of those grants have been denied and that money will be, you'll be seeing it in the upcoming budget, $31,000 for 10 new radios for EMS. Um, I asked about funding 
our two new two new cardiac monitors because we have one that will be coming up on seven years and the following year another one coming up uh, that will be in seven years. That's the durable lifespan of medical equipment. So those need to be replaced and that will be one of those will be coming up in the next budget. In our budget meetings last year, um, and I brought that up, the list that I presented to the chair, who at the time was our liaison, um, and I, I was told the ARPA money doesn't exist anymore. It's building money now. Uh, the feds had changed the rules for how the money, for how towns had to account for the money to make it easier for the towns to use that money. And I totally get that. But I was told the ARPA money doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it, it, it's in a building fund, and that's what purpose of that, that we're going to use it for. Uh, Can I just interject? Sure, go right ahead, Chris. The only thing, um, my understanding uh, from my, because I had similar questions when Eric Dodd was here, and my understanding was is that we received a little over a million dollars. Is that correct, Jason? Yeah, I think it's right around a million. Yeah, exactly. million, 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 million. One point, it was 1.1 1. 1. 1 million, Chris. Yeah. So my understanding was is that um, that money was utilized in the police department to pay payroll benefits. No? No. No. Okay. No. Tina can speak to no, this better than that. That's not correct. Right? No. I, I am, I, I, and please believe me, I am not trying to throw anybody no, out of the bus here. No. But right now I have some righteous anger that I was told, literally told, don't ask about the ARPA money anymore. It's in a building fund, and that's what we're using it for. And I do not begrudge my highway friends and, uh, for, and, and you good people for financing it through that fund. But damn it, I played by the rules last year on behalf of my people uh, when we did budget. And I ended up with a budget that was in negative numbers. And I asked for things that the ARPA money clearly covered, and I was told no, because I was trying to better this service and reduce the burden on these taxpayers by using that money that was given to this town as ARPA money that then got converted to building money. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to throw people under the bus here. I really am not, but I am just venting what I believe right now is righteous anger and a systolic blood pressure that's probably about 200. Uh, uh, you, you have the list. I still have a copy of the list of things that I thought that ARPA money should be used for, and it no longer existed. Thank you. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to have to vent like that, but I'm not begrudging them a sidewalk machine self-finance because it makes sense for the taxpayers. But I had stuff that made sense for the taxpayers too. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I just want to address a couple of things that Bill talked about. We did get a couple of grants for premium pay for his employees. One was for vaccinations, of which they paid the employees that volunteered to go out $45 an hour to do that. Another one, they paid a lump sum to uh, people based on a formula bill calculated uh, for another grant that we received. So his people did, in fact, receive some grant funds for their pay. The LCT and at all their guidance has always said, do not use this money for something that is a reoccurring thing. Like don't establish a new program for it because that means when the money runs out, you're gonna have to pay that out of your tax dollars. I think that is the reason that funds were not used for things like payroll. ARPA money, we took the ARPA money and we used it to pay our current police salaries and benefits because that is what we were told that we needed to do in order to free the money up so that we could then use it to do buildings or whatever you chose to do. And that's why we did that. That was audited and everything. That money stayed with the town. It's in a fund. But we were strongly advised not to spend it on things that were potentially reoccurring. You can't give somebody $20 an hour today and then next year when you don't have the money say we can't afford it. So that's one of the reasons that that kind of, of uh, thing was not done. 
I just wanted to clarify how that all worked. So, but that's pretty much what I said. Is that money, the art money came in and was utilized in the police department. So, what we what we commonly refer to carpet money is really fund balance money mm -hmm. from the police department because it was paid to ARPA funds, and therefore we had residual fund balance of. That's right. Eight hundred and something like that. That's right. So it, it's that, not ARPA money anymore. Right. It's splitting hairs here, but it's just, it's just it's not ARPA money. So again, I think that we use that money appropriately. Um, that doesn't solve Bill's problem or anybody else's problem, but it just doesn't. Well, I mean, here. we can talk about different other things um, that Bill was concerned about in our budget talks, right. but I'm just explaining why the uh, ARPA money before it became building fund money was not utilized in that way. That it was strongly recommended you don't do that. Is there any um, like specific budget that we could see that was exactly where when it was ARPA money, where that ARPA money went to with a balance so that we know how much was transferred over and is now building? So I think that's you could see question. that right in your audit. You can see that right in your audit. You will see, you know, when if you look at your audit, you will see that because she had to disclose that. I don't know the page, but she had to disclose that um, because that, in fact, was the whole reason that she did a single audit. She had to look okay. specifically at that and see how it flowed through the town to make sure that it was done correctly. I, I'm not questioning. I, I just. That's what I know is everybody has been asking for is just they just want to see where it was spent when it was ARPA and what the balance was and where it was moved over. That's yes, so yeah, that's all can... in the audit and I haven't had a chance to really look at the okay. audit, but it is all there. Okay, I, so it's, I think that would. How much money from ARPA was made to renovate no, upstairs? Tom, we're not we're, we're not going to talk about that right now. I'll get the answers talking. for you. We're going to I'll get we'll look at this right, audit and see. Tom, 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 I do. I do. Okay. Bill, I apologize that that didn't work out the way it was supposed to work out. It didn't. I take responsibility for that. It's not a matter of responsibility. Well, it does. I will. Yeah. I was given a set of rules. I went by the rules I was given. Um, any other department heads? Oh, okay. I just wanted to let everybody know that the tax bills were mailed out last Wednesday. Um, so everybody should probably have them by now. Um, if you don't get it by Wednesday, reach out to Mitzi Elizabeth or I, and when you get it, please open it. Today was the, the last deadline with the state to do your homestead. Um, Tommy Gardner was great. He ran an article on the paper and I had people come in today that um, didn't have their homestead that thought that they did. Um, check it. If if you have questions, um, come, come ask before they're due, when there's time to help. Thank you. All right. Um, Town Administrator's report. Uh, I got a few things. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce Bonnie McDermott, who's sitting to my right. Uh, last budget we approved, I think it was around $5,000 for somebody to help Zoom and take minutes uh, for various different meetings. Uh, so, Bonnie, this is her first select board meeting. You'll be seeing her again. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so welcome, Bonnie. And she will be doing um, planning and DRB. Is that correct? Uh, if they agree to it, she will be. As far as zooming goes, uh, and she'll be doing their minutes if both the committees are good with it. Um, so, next, the search committee for the town manager. The, just a reminder, anybody that's interested in serving on that committee, your letter of interest need to be in by uh, the 23rd. Um, with that search committee, uh, we were, I was going to suggest that we have a special meeting next week uh, on Monday to decide what that committee looks like and then to also pick who will be on that committee. 
because after next week, we don't have another meeting till November 6th. And at this point, we're in a holding pattern with VLCT until we can get that committee formed. Okay. So that works for everybody. I don't expect it to be too long of a meeting. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, works for me. Okay. Um, just uh, next, uh, also next week on the 25th, 5.30 is our joint meeting with the trustees. This will be at the VFW and it will be Zoomed. Thank you. And there's a special, um, I think maybe Judy mentioned it, some the, the, the um, Zoom procedure link might be different. It is going to be different. That's I'm not sitting next to Jason, so I can't talk into the mic over there. Um, there it is going to be pay attention for the VFW if you are going to zoom in because the Zoom link is the Morrisville trustees. It's their Zoom equipment and it's their computer. So um, it is not the town of Morristown's link. It is in the warning. It will be on Front Porch Forum again. Um, and it will be on the website for the, the town of Morristown underneath the agenda in minutes. It's right there. Um, but you pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judy kind of hit on this earlier. We did hire a project manager, uh, Carrie Johnson. She just retired as the St. Albans town manager. So we'll be employing her you know, on a part-time as needed basis. Uh, the Merck grant is one task. Uh, there's some wastewater tasks that, you know, have been on the desk um, all summer. And there's some other projects that we're gonna delegate to her to tackle. Uh, we'll be doing so, uh, select board training on October 30th at 3.30 PM here. Uh, hit on this earlier too. We are in the budget process for 24-25. Uh, Tina and myself have been meeting with department heads, trying to get uh, all our ducks in a row. The first meeting uh, with the select board is the emergency services, November 13th, if my memory is correct. Um, I'm looking into the, our right-of-way permits that we use. It was brought up last meeting that the, the cuts that we were doing across the road, uh, they were settling after a period of time. So I'm in the process of researching what some other towns are doing that would hold these contractors accountable for more than, you know, Kevin will inspect it when it's done, but then we want to make sure a year from now, if it does settle after a frost, um, thaw cycle, that it's, it's fixed. So hopefully I'll have more information on that in the future. And that's it. Can you clarify another 30th? October 30th? The select board training? It's closed close to the public. It's just a select board. All right, thank you. Um, select board comments. We'll start with sorry, Chris. Um, I don't have anything to my good talk enough. Don. I just have one. Um, as you all know, I was there for the last meeting. I didn't get a chance to talk about our former colleague Brian Kellogg and um, I know that there was a, a gathering for him yesterday and unfortunately I wasn't able to make that either. Um, Brian was a, was a great uh, great member of this board. He had a huge smile on his face all the time. He drew his smile, found a way to make you smile. And that's a pretty precious uh, attribute for any one of us to have. We all kind of know his history and the number of years he put into the select board fire department and his thankless job taking care of animals in this in this town we certainly love those animals and then the other thing i just wanted to mention and it was tommy gardner that brought this up to me when he called me and asked for some comments about brian and there was discussion we've named the bridge down by donaldson's the uh Francis Faber Bridge. And there were comments in the past about naming other bridges. And I'd just like the select board to think about perhaps naming a bridge after Brian. I think he would uh, he'd be tickled by the idea. <laughs> he tickled by the And uh, I will throw out right away the Walton, Walton Road Bridge is a possibility. So that's all I got. <laughs> 
Laura. That's, that's so sweet, the bridge idea. Um, I really don't have anything. I'm sorry for everyone whose taxes went up, mine went up. It's painful. Um, different year. Let's move on. <laughs> Richard. I feel the same way as Laura. My taxes went up considerably, and I think we need to do a good job to fund the fund our town, but keep the cost down. Um, I know we all feel the pain, but we do <clears throat> move forward as a community and make sure that everyone has a new plan. Thank you. Um, Jason mentioned that we're going to have a, a select board training. I brought this up back in March, I think, and we haven't had a full select board. Or we're working on the budget for the entire time, and then we didn't have a full select board. So now we have a full select board. So we're working on building trust and developing a working agreement. Um, I haven't heard from. You. I'm not coming. Yeah. And can, so, you, can you share with us um, why? It's, um, I've expressed to you in the past, and it's not something I'm willing to share. And um, I've made my commitment to the select board, and I'm not willing to do extracurricular i've spent 40 years in management so no i'm sorry i work full time okay and Thank i don't you. appreciate being called out in front of the audience um any community comments uh, my name is tom Plutia. Uh, first of all uh if you took responsibility and you said you did of the ems the pop the mess up on that. You can also take responsibility for how many times I had through that budget process last year where that ARCA money went. And I was told that $860,000 was in a bank. The money, the $1,100,000 minus was paid for the renovations upstairs. That's the ARCA money. Why it didn't go to them is your responsibility. Is that correct? You don't have to answer that. We know. There's a few people on in this room and on there that went out and beyond there, uh, beyond to, to do my taxes for me in the year and tell me that my taxes were going to be decreased. They were wrong. They increased. Everybody here knows the feeling. They increased. So all your projections about how low our taxes will be were wrong. If mine went up, by golly, I hate to see some of the others. My neighbor now is paying on fixed budget, mind you, $12,000 taxes. $12,000 because he doesn't have, or they don't have lucky enough to get homestead. They will next year, but not this year. $12,000 on a fixed income. Think about that. When you, when you decide to spend money for a friggin' plow and leave the EMS with radios that don't work, trying to save somebody's life. Think about that. And you don't read front page forum, Judy. Yesterday, this was in there. You should have read it. Did everyone in Marsville have the house appraised for almost double what it was last year? Then get a tax bill in the last week that went up a ridiculous amount? I know I haven't done any upgrades on my property in or out. So I'm not sure how property value doubles. Can't afford to do. Can't afford to, to do fix up. What are people supposed to do if they can't afford to pay us? I told them to call you. I emailed back to call Sarah. She may have a, a plan for her. We've been telling you and telling you there are people out there that are gonna suffer terribly when you keep raising these budgets, 14.7 last year, 12.5 the year before. Okay, thank you, Tom. That was 14 points. I'm not done. Well, your time is up. My last thing is, we meet you twice a month. Let the people talk. 
They Left don't. them part. Don't tell them they've been up twice. Don't tell them your time's run out. B. Thank you, Tom. I think we've got to be fair, Tom, with two minutes on everything. All right. Thank you. Is there someone else like to speak? Community comments? <clears throat> Jerry Throne. Uh, I want to thank the police department for putting the speed sign up on Congress Street. Uh, I think it's helped some of the cars slow down, but I think maybe you should take a look and see what the distance is uh, that people can see uh, the message that it's giving them. If it was in a, a location further north, I think people would see it for a longer distance. Good to know. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? <clears throat> I think it can be a little confusing what the traffic situation is at the corner of Portland and Bridge. Tell us who you are. Oh, sorry, Alex here. Um, I live here in Morristown. Sometimes I just got into things and I forget to say that. Um, but I think especially if someone is turning left off of Bridge onto Portland and someone is turning left off of um, Portland onto Bridge, because then nobody has a stop sign and they can't both go at the same time and so i think it needs to be a little bit clearer who has priority uh, i never know when the time to bring this up is so here it is um hi evelyn throne marsville <laughs> um thank you yeah, you know who i am uh and so i i'm noticed that there's a lot of salt that gets used on the roads and and the sidewalks um i do understand the safety issue i'm cognizant of the fact that people you know have the feeling that they need to get out all the time safely um but i i do think that the toxicity in the creeks is increasing the toxicity and the salinity in the rivers is increasing it's it's not just the rivers themselves it's it's the plantings that are um you know the natural plantings the man-made plantings suffer i just like to see what can be done to maybe set a limit on if it's only so much snow or only you know just or maybe have the machine set a certain way so that less salt comes out there there's just has to be a way to do less i know when i was young there wasn't salt anywhere of course we fell, but you know, <laughs> and I don't want that, but I just think that it, if we, we've got to look at this more carefully, it's, it's a real environmental hazard that is increasing. I think it's being used more, more and more all the time. My name is Jan Paris, and I just want to publicly say that Bill, we support you in everything that you're looking for. And in the future budgets, anything we can do to sway things in your favor, we're going to try to do. And anybody I talk to, I'm going to tell them that we need to support the EMS and Copley Hospital. All the people that are out there saving our lives are the ones that we really need to take care of. Yeah. Um, Tommy on the Zoom. Yes, this is Nancy Donovan, and I want to concur with that. I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that we are not providing EMS with the equipment they ask for. That is not an unreasonable thing. They need new radios and they need to have their durable equipment replaced. And I feel like that is a higher priority uh, than it has been. And it needs to change and it needs to be done now. Thank you, anyone else? Okay. Don't forget to approve the warrants. Oh, yes, thank you. I like um, I make a motion to approve the warrants. Thank you. I'll Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the warrants have been approved. Ready? Ready. I've got a number of these. I move to go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
I move to go into executive session to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee subject to T1 VSA section 31383 to include interim town administrator Jason Luno and interim human resources director Team Sweet, administrative assistant Judy Alberi. I have a motion and a second on any discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge of a pending contract negotiation will clearly place the town at a disadvantage by disclosing its negotiation strategy. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into executive session to discuss pending contract negotiations under provisions of Title I, Section Number 13. A1 of the Vermont statutes and include interim town administrator Jason Luno, finance director Tina Sweet, and administrative assistant Judy Alberti. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Oh, I move to go into executive session because I find the premature general public knowledge of pending or possible civil litigation or prosecution to which the public body is or may be party will clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing its negotiation strategy. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into executive session to discuss the pending and probable litigation or prosecution under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1 of the Vermont statutes to include interim town administrator Jason Luno and in finance oh. director Tina Sweet. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Tina. I move to enter who's executive Scott? session I because I find I the premature Scott general was. public knowledge of labor relationships with employees to the body will clearly place okay. the town at a substantial disadvantage. I just wanted to know who it was. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to enter the exec executive session to discuss labor relations agreements with employees under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1B of Vermont statutes to include interim town administrator Jason Luno, interim human resources director Tina Sweet, and highway superintendent Kevin Barrows. We had a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Okay, we're in executive session. 